Well, welcome back, my fans, to our second set of the day here on day one of our SPL playoffs. I'm Jay Mike. I got Mifflin joining me here on the desk. Or I guess in this case, I'm joining you since you were already on the desk before. So now I get to join Mifflin. Here's to get ready to jump into our second set. Leviathans and Kings will be the matchup to see who gets to move on to, I believe, play the Oni Warriors. And we get to take a nice look at the bracket there. First game, or first set of our day, goes 3-1. Oh, in favor of the Jade Dragon, so a nice little start to our weekend, but we get to continue this through. And it's best of fives every single day throughout the course of this weekend. Two of those at that to see which four teams get to qualify up to Worlds, Myth. Yeah, I, I'm really excited for this one. I mean, not only is it qualification for Worlds, I'll always be the first one to tell the fans at home and everyone listening, there's also money on the line, right? First place taking home $10,000. So it's a cool 2000 per player. I don't know about you guys, but... Two grand in my pocket right now would go a pretty long way. So love love watching stuff like that. When there's money online, when there's stakes, when there's qualification for Worlds, feels like these teams play just a little bit different. Yeah, we can take a look at a nice little graphic to help explain kind of how everything breaks down in the long form of it. Remember, it's every single match this weekend is best of five. Our top four teams will qualify to the Smite World Championship in the quarterfinals. And then depending on where they qualified in for their seeding, we'll have seeding matches on Sunday, to tournament first through fourth. If you're first seed, you get to pick your opponent from the remaining four teams that will be found at the very first week of January in that last chance groups qualifier. You get to pick from any of the four teams that qualify there. Second, then gets to take from the next three. Third, between the last one, then if you're fourth seed, well, you just get whoever ends up being left over for that bracket. We can take a look at our current bracket, though, for this weekend. As mentioned, Jay Dragons already got their first win of the week. They 3-1 over the Ravens in our first set of the day. Now we move on to the Leviathans and the Kings to see which team will not only win, but then have the honor going against the Oni Warriors for their matchup tomorrow. Jay Dragons will play against the Styx Ferrymen for their opposition. And winners of those matchups, they qualify in, and then it'll be a matter of which seeding they have, either first or second. Loser of this set, not out of the tournament yet. They'll join the Ravens down into the loser's bracket. Losers of tomorrow's will jump down there as well. So keep your eyes over the course of this bracket and for these two teams. And I think right now this is a... Big match for the Camelot Kings more than anything else. The Leviathans have been a very dominant team over the course of the phase. They've had a very impressive running from their phase one transition into phase two. Now having Panda Cat on this roster has looked really good for this Leviathans team. So a matchup at, for probably a lot of fans, expectations for Leviathans to win this one out, Myth. Leviathans largely hailed as one of the top three teams in the league right now, and, and rightfully so ever since P uh, Panda Cat has joined the squad. Camelot Kings, of course, the reigning world champions have had a bit of an unfor or not unforgettable, forgettable for them, unforgettable in that it is broken from expectations phase. Uh, certainly struggling a bit more than I think anyone would have expected, but an interesting matchup to be sure, JMAC. I mean, the season eight world champions versus the season nine world champions, doesn't get much better than that. And you got a couple of big stories along here as well. Adapting, coming back into the league, jumping on the squad, aiming for his chance to go for a third title of his own. Then for the Camelot Kings really on the side opposite side. And he's going to get another ring, maybe? Another ring, different team this time for him. Though you look over at the Camelot Kings, not only are all of them, aside from Quig, looking for another ring, Yark would be going for his third ring, second time in that role. So a lot of stories to be told over the course of this playoff and in towards the World Championship. Before we can even get to all to that, we have Slaney, the coach for the Atlantis Leviathan, standing by for a pregame interview. That's right, I've got Slaney standing by, and up front I'm going to ask, I know like a lot of the conversation, especially like when you picked up Panda Cat, and, and even recently on Recaps he's mentioned it, how was the, the practice environment coming into this event? I mean, any team with Shinto on it is going to have a bit of a, a crazy practice environment. I mean, Max and Shinto love to bounce each other off. They're always fun, but not always the most productive scrims, but it's fun, which is pretty important. Yeah, having fun smiles all around, right? That's the, the important part. So we're on a new patch. Things have changed without revealing anything going into it. Do you think a lot has changed since the last time we saw you play? Absolutely nothing, no. I mean, there's a new god. There's, there's a new god. All right. So that's, uh, that's all I'm gleaming from this is expect some Amon in this, this set. But otherwise, yeah, it has at least what we just saw looked mostly the same. All the dragons were a little weird. Uh, the Kings, they're an interesting team because it feels like there were a lot of moments in this last phase where they stepped up to their competition, still unable to get those wins. I'm thinking of that 50-minute game against the Ferrymen. So they've shown that they have those capabilities. What are your thoughts on them as an opponent and, and thoughts going into the set? I mean, Kings are tough because they have obviously five really good players. Um, and I think it's just, I mean, everyone kind of knows it's not really their meta right now. Um, but at the same time, because they're five good players, you can never really underestimate them because they take games off of you. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't think the meta's changed too much, but you never know what they've been doing in practice, and they could have found something that works for them. So we need to make sure that we're not taking them easy because they could come out and surprise us because um, they're a bunch of good players. 
Well, it sounds like you got the right hat on your shoulders, man. Good luck in your games. Thanks for your time. And we'll throw this back to the desk. Sound like scrims have been maybe a little crazy for the Leviathans, but also gleaming a little bit from the very end of that. Unknowing as to maybe what the Camelot Kings are, are, are going to be bringing out for this event, maybe it leads me to believe that these guys haven't been scrimming as much against each other since the end of the phase, or maybe they have not even each other at all. through. So not going to know exactly what the, the Kings are going to bring out. We'll have to see what kind of meta has developed between the two, at least based off what Slady's saying. Not a whole lot it has really changed meta-wise. I think we see a little bit of that reflected in, in our first set of the day. Not too many change-ups there. I mean, we saw, you know, Chalk kind of come back, and that was cool. And then we immediately kind of dive back into the mage solos once again. Yeah, and it's worth noting, I'm going to throw some flowers Slaney's way because he's he's too modest a guy to do it himself. That is one of the most prolific coaches in Smite history, full stop. I mean, he has just been around the scene for an incredibly long time. I'd even had the privilege for about... I want to say one month, maybe two months, where he was my coach. Uh, then he benched me. Good decision, clearly, because he's still in the league. Uh, so Slaney absolutely deserves to be here and needs to be recognized as a, a formidable force on the battleground. Certainly has led a lot of his teams historically to, to good positions. That said, has found himself surrounded by a bunch of really good players here. Highlight reels rolling through, and there are plenty of highlights to pull from from the Leviathans who've had themselves an explosive phase so far. Feels like they have got very adaptable play styles. Sometimes they'll be willing to play through mid. You know, Slaney alludes to it briefly uh, that, that Shinto is a, a big personality, and I agree. He's the type of dude that is going to tell you, hey, play through me, or we're not going to play at all. And Shinto means it when he says it. But Panda Cat, similarly capable of doing the exact same thing. So I think the, the duality of those two bouncing between each other and saying, okay, this game it's going to be me. This game it's going to be me. We're going to build a composition around mid lane. Oh, no, we're going to play through dual lane pressure, play for Gold Fury. That adaptability has made it very difficult to lock down the Leviathans. And I think in general, we've also seen so much more flexibility out of the Leviathans. Team comps, the, the gods that they're drafting as well. Panda Cat's really kind of been able to open the door over in dual lane for this team. So I'm excited to see. What the Leviathans bring today. I mean, you heard what he said, right, when he joined the team? Yeah. He literally comes in the studio and says, yo, Leva, six seed, that is not good. You want me? We're going to have to take that up a notch. And uh, he did. And they did. And now they're sitting here as I believe they're number three seed overall between the six teams. And up against them is the Camelot Kings. And pulling a little bit, at least from what Slaney again said in the interview, you don't know what these guys are going to do because this may not have been at least a meta that favors them over the course of this phase. Sounds like not a whole lot, and so far we haven't really seen a whole lot of change-ups from the previous meta in towards this one with the 10.12 patch. But you never know. You got a bunch of thinkers on this team. They might pull something out of nowhere. I mean, you look at the, the beginning of the phase, nobody's playing Lancelot. Nobody's even thinking about that god. Captain Swift pulls it out, and it gets banned from almost every set beyond there. So all it sometimes takes is that one little breakout, that one little game to kind of shift the momentum for the Camelot Kings. And I, I think you're right to bring up Twig in particular because his god pool has been called into question pretty frequently so far this year. You're right that Lancelot has been his best pick and has actually uh, earned itself some dedicated target bans and one of the only players in the league going towards it. And still somehow it feels like every single time he's on the field we're going to see at least one ban top three towards that Lancelot. But because he has got that one pick that is just head and shoulders above his next best. It makes it a little bit easier to ban him out. Has recently started to notch Rat at that same level. I'd say his Rat Attacker maybe even a little bit better just because that god is straight up just better. But if they, the Camelot Kings that is, have found maybe just one more, two more picks they can slot into the jungle, that's going to open up the door to give Variety some of his comfort selections, create some space for BMT, who is, for my money, the win condition of the Camelot Kings, has been one of the most consistent mid laners so far this year. In a year where the Camelot Kings have struggled, BMT has still stayed at the top of the league, in my opinion. He's, he's in that conversation for top three mid laners as far as I'm concerned. So finding ways to facilitate him and play through him, I think, going to be major for the Camelot Kings, especially as we get closer and closer to that world championship run. There is... Difficulty off the field, of course, that has hampered the Camelot Kings. Of course, Twig, recently having a child, has had his attention uh, distracted a bit, has to pay attention to his progenity. Uh, also having their, their support uh, switched out now, Quig playing for the Camelot Kings as genetics has jumped ship, has probably been a bit of a growing pain as well. But it all comes down to play on field day of, and if the Camelot Kings have got it, Slaney said it himself, five really good players in that booth. And all five of them with some kind of carry potential to themselves as well. We, we want to talk about consistency, BMT, Yarkor. They've been very consistent spearheads for this team, kind of leading the charge more than anything. I, I love what we've been seeing out of BMT's god pool as of recent. He stuck to his standards, but he's also kind of been breaking out of the mold a bit. We've seen a little bit of Uller kind of pop through. We saw the E-Shell in that highlight. While that game 
wasn't a win. BMT looked really good on that god. I believe that was right after some of her pu her buffs that came through. Nine, he goes two, nine two, and 10 on that Eesh. game. Was a very strong showing over the course of the game for him. The rest of the team kind of falls apart towards, the, I believe it was a late game team fight that kind of ends that one out there uh, up against the Oni Warriors. So we'll have to see what the Kings and what the Leviathans can bring it to the picks and bands for game number one of their first match here in the SPL playoffs and the world qualification. Leviathans. We'll go with the Baba Yaga band, and I think this one to me sticks out more just because of what we saw in the first set. If we said one Baba Yaga game and no Baba Yaga bands from the, from the previous set. I mean, maybe it has to do with what Slaney had said as well. I believe if we were to ask the same question to, to the Ravens or the Dragons, hey, what changed on that patch? They'd probably say, oh, this god's now a lot better, or maybe this is looking a lot better here. With Slaney essentially communicating, look, we're, we're treating 10-12 like 10-11 and 10-10. It's going to be largely the same. I think you can expect to see largely the same bands and largely the same pick compositions from the Atlantis Leviathans. And they're top three for a reason. Though Those compositions work. Their strategies worked and have continued to work. So we'll see. It really is up to the Camelot Kings. And Slaney, again, did a really good job priming this set. It's on the Kings to match and play up to the Atlantis Leviathans. The Kings are the challenger here in the set. Reigning world champions, to be sure, but still struggling in most recent months. Najah to round out the bands for the Atlantis Leviathans. Few eyes towards the jungle there. Camelot Kings just keeping that support god pool down. Wonder though, a lot of value still on the table. My eyes immediately go towards things like the, the highly prioritized mages. Raijin comes to mind. Morgan Le Fay, of course. Opwash still out there. Chernabog still on the table too. A lot of very, very strong global presences out there. So it will be the Chernabog ban. Maman Brigitte, still available. We had seen in the previous set, was getting a lot of first pick potential. I wonder if the Atlantis Leviathans value it that highly. Maman, the answer to that is yes, they do. First pick for the Leviathan. So now I guess the question comes down to where does it go? We saw two games from Dardes, one game from Scream, so two mids and a jungle game out of the god. And I think they showed equal strengths. Uh, in both of those roles. A bit of a struggle, game one for Dardes on, on it in the mid lane. Game two, a pop off, 10 and three. Scream has a great performance on in game number three in the jungle. So I wonder where we do see this mom on square off, because it does feel like she's got two, maybe three, if you consider the solo lane in that potential. On the opposite end, the Camelot Kings will value another one of those high priority mages, Opwash, and then Uller to round out their top two. Yeah, I was really expecting the Opwash on her lock in, considering just how strong that pick had been recently and how much pressure you really want in that dual lane. Instead, it's the Ool lock in. It is worth noting. We've seen some flexibility from Ool. Yark plays it most recently, but within the last six games, Big Man Tings has piloted it the once as well. So, not exactly sure where the Camelot Kings will be allocating that pick. And Lance Leviathans, on the other hand, also grabbing a good deal of flexibility. We've seen Maman Brigitte in two roles now. We've seen Poseidon in two or three roles so far this year. If I had to guess, and it is a guess, holy, I, I, I really do just prefer seeing Maman Brigitte in the jungle. I know a lot of people say, oh, yeah, the jungle main on the desk is saying he wants the, the new strong, <laughs> fancy, fun pick to be played in his role. And Yeah, I agree. I, right. I, I, I just think from what we had seen from Dardas in the previous set, and that is the only um, experience or, or knowledge we have on how Maman Brigitte plays in the, in the laning phase, could struggle to clear some of those ways. Struggled once that jungler started to show a bit of presence. Did not like those boxing matchups. So I think putting her in the jungle really alleviates a lot of that weakness. And by the time you're three slotted, you're just going to have that one shot potential that, that makes her so, so valuable. Poseidon, though, seems to have really raised in the power rankings, hasn't he? Could go over towards that soul lane. And I think that is likely could also go mid Aphrodite to round out the top three for the Camelot Kings. And that's flexibility, too. But more often than not, that's your support. Quig has really been the one kind of piloting this god for this team. If you were to go to other teams, maybe like the Jade Dragons, you could say probably could be a potential for Dardes, but with the Kings, it really does feel like this Afro has been locked for support. And, and maybe kind of going on that point about the Poseidon that you brought up, where he's really been rising up, do you think that maybe this is a, a byproduct of a lot of mages going to soul lane and not a lot of them being super mobile, where if you go into Warrior in that match, you pick up Teleport, you rotate across? Poseidon gives you a lot of movement speed to move across these maps. Yeah, Poseidon getting involved in those mid-team fights pretty easily. Doesn't need to go towards the, the teleport relic. Instead, could just utilize that movement speed. I think it's also got to do with Totem of Skulls. We saw very frequently, hey, I got Kraken. It's a solo lane matchup. I'm not killing my enemy laner. 
I will be confirming the totem of skulls though, and they grab it pretty consistently. Should be able to pick it up every single time. Only thing that, that would make that a, a poor trade is if a jungler shows up and you don't have Kraken to defend yourself. But junglers are not spending a whole lot of time in the soul lane as of recent because duo is just much higher priority. The, the defense buff, the gold fury, just really does stretch the jungler over towards that duo lane as opposed to the soul lane. So if it is going to be Maman Bridge mid beside the solo, I expect we'll see the Atlantis Leviathans perhaps grab a bridge pick out of the jungle and, and just have those two hyper farm it up till mid to late game. We do see Lancelot and Kakulkin banned by the Leviathans. Camelot Kings take Thor and Sobek away. Maybe wondering if this Maman is going to be going to jungle or not. Just going with a safe ban of adapting Thor by the Camelot Kings. So now we're going to see if this Uller is going to be going towards mid or ADC potentially with this next pick. Is Opwash going to go mid or solo? Could be answered with this pick as well. We have seen some flexibility in the gods. Still more often in the solo lane instead. So there, are other, there are some other high priority mages that could flex towards both those roles. Morgan Le Fay no notably still up. Raijin as well could go for one of these teams. So we'll keep our eyes on the remainder of those as the Camelot Kings start dipping to their bank time a bit to go for this next selection. One pick that Captain Twig has fallen back to multiple times when some of his top ones have been taken away has been this Erlong Shen. It's being hovered by the Camelot Kings. We'd see if that one gets locked in. It'll be a flip, actually. Don Zaburo. Haven't seen him at all this year. All, all throughout Season 10. Not a single pick for this god. Will now be drafted by not necessarily the team I would expect. I would have thought this would have been a Panda Cap pick, but Donza for the Kings. So I think that does now confirm Ool for mid, Opwash over to that soul lane, and it's not going to be Aphrodite Jungle. So we got the duo lane now for the Camelot Kings. Dan Zaburo's most recent changes have made him an incredibly formidable force on the battleground. As far as I'm concerned, he has got maybe just straight up the best boxing potential full stop of any hunters. Previously, it was 20% auto attack mitigation so long as he was standing within the active field of his third ability. That's the one that turns him to a leaf. If he's not a leaf, he's getting now 15% damage mitigation. Not auto attack mitigation, damage mitigation. All sources. So you can tank up minion waves. You can tank up any mage abilities. You got a Kraken coming your way? What if I? What if it did 15% less damage because my Aegis is down? That is now an opportunity available to Danza Burrow, which makes it very difficult to want to fight him, not even taking into account the haste, which gives him just massive advantage in the boxing matchup against another hunter. So I think that pick, properly valued now, starting to show a bit of presence in the SPL. And then a Wheelish on the other side, a pick that we've seen pretty often from adapting as of recent. And I will continue to say it every time it comes up. That god's really good. That god is really good. More people need to be playing it. The damage output and pressure and control that a Wheelish affords you throughout the first 10 levels of the game it, it is just ridiculous. Uh, you could put me on record for saying that Feather Step might as well be an execute once you hit level 6. It's like a 50% execute, it feels like, if, you, if you're utilizing it properly. So much damage on the board here for the Atlantis Leviathans. And that is the bridge pick that I was looking for. It's a very strong team fight composition from the Levi's, but they're going to need to get to that point. A Wheelish is the type of pick that can get you there. Go along with the, the Wheelish. Baron, for wrong use, something we haven't seen very much from him historically. I believe only six games played from what I'm seeing here. Only one of those games has been a win. So hasn't had so much success on Baron over the course of his career, but we've been seeing a little bit of Baron kind of pop now and now to round out the rest of this composition. The Camelot Kings on the opposite side of Mifflin go for Hebo for Captain Twig. So a very squishy composition across the board. No traditional tanks, no guardians, no warriors at all. It's a triple mage on one side, double, no, nope, I guess, sorry, triple mage, double hunter for there. The only non-major hunter we end up seeing is just this wheels for the Leviathans. How do these two compositions realistically kind of play out through the course of this game? Man, both teams are gonna struggle a whole lot on initiation. So I think if it goes to an even state at a Fire Giant or Gold Fury Dance, we're looking at a whole lot of staring contest, right? Who's gonna make the first move? Who's got better counter initiation? Is anyone gonna get poked out a little bit too much? Anyone takes one step forward, all of a sudden water spouts delivered you directly to us, right? Or maybe on the other side, oh, your beads are down or you use Crushing Wave to escape, Baron Somni's pulling you back in. So I, I, I think finding the balance point of who's starting the engagement is going to be essentially the decider here between these two squads. I would say, though, looking at early game potential, the Leviathans have got a whole lot more of it. I'm assuming that it's Hebo jungle on the other side. That takes a little bit more time to scale up and could get 
really, really harassed by Noelish. Well, let's we'll have to see how these two compositions play as we jump into our second set of the day. Game number one between the Atlantis Leviathans and the Camelot Kings, and we'll throw it over to our casters. Thanks so much, J-Mac and Mifflin and Trelly. Oh, this is a fun one. It's Gort's Trelly, of course. It's Doug who's going to give us the view in. I am excited. Uh, and intrigued. Not a guardian nor warrior in sight for this one. Which makes me think that we, we either are in for what Mifflin had just said, a staring contest or a bloodbath, one of the two. But there's so much that stands out to me, and I think the thing, well, first off, now that's standing out, 69 in favor of the Leviathans to the 31 in favor of the Kings. You agreeing with Twitch chat here? Well, as far as past performance goes, I definitely thought the Camelot Kings would have a bit of a struggle in this tournament. I remember saying something along the lines of they could use that battle through the the lower bracket, right? They need that extra experience. They yeah. need to try and work their way through. But as far as compositions go, I do like what the Camelot Kings have done. I think Uller is in a fantastic position at the moment. Get some good pressure. You can stay safe. If you look at the aggression, though, adapting and Shinto, double blink. That doesn't tell me hey, we're going to be sitting back playing it safe, right? That tells me at level 2, level 3, right after we clear this wave, maybe during the wave, we're going to be looking for our first blood. If I had to guess, I would say it's on a Captain Twig. That's the target, right? That's a Hebo with Blink. I've got my eyes on Shinto and adapting, and I'm looking at that Hebo just about now. I've got my eyes on Shinto for multiple reasons, right? First off, it's Shinto. Always watch Shinto when the Leviathans are playing, but also... Uh, like you said, the kill potential, playing the newest god. Uh, you get so much, I think, that's going in. Although, a couple of shots go straight. Good axe from BMT. And I think you can see that the poke Ooh. is not something easy to mess with. The range, specifically, from the Kings in this mid-duo seems to be something they might struggle with. Uh, but I'm not too worried about the health bar yet. Yeah, there's definitely some, some propensities to worry over here as they get aggressive. It's going to be on Twig. Like you said, whether that's where they get aggressive or, at this point, who's the aggressor? Instead, they're going to back away. I'm also really intrigued by this duo lane. It feels, uh, admittedly, this is wild to say, both of them feel very, like, Dragons-esque, but from last year, right? Where, where it's like, okay, you've got Afro, Danza, I could have seen PBM and, and Panda Cat running that together. And then you've got Baron, Hachi, which I also could see PBM and Panda Cat running together. And only one of those guys is actually in this game, and that's Panda Cat. Adapting, though, going to go in on Variety. Forces the beads early. A little bit of extra damage. Variety with an interesting juke. Walks right into the knock-up, and it's an easy cleanup from there. Adapting first blood. Yeah, he had to make a choice, right? You either beats Feather Step or you beats the knock-up. Hopefully, you don't have to beat the knock-up if you can turn around in time, but Variety couldn't make that decision. Runs back to try and juke and just cannot find it. And this happens so much where you got to know. Adapting is caught. Hey, he's going right. Variety has overwhelming pressure over on the right side of the map. He is winning lane. He almost solos fine, okay. But if you're that far up and you, you're you're a squishy outwash, Wheelix is going to come over and easily make quick work of you. Something that's being highlighted here, and it was another reason that I didn't think Maman Brigitte was going to be that good of a mid laner. Her clear is not great. I mean, this is a jungle clear through and through. Her mid lane clear non-existent. Shinto is losing the fight between the wave. Like, Tiggs isn't even hitting that many abilities. It's just minions that are damaging him down. And it keeps things interesting. Adapting's going for a little fight against Twig, although the damage might be going against him. Knockup's going to be good, but you need a little more now that Variety has joined around. Leap from Suku, going to get some distance, oh. but no, it turns in, tries to get the auto once the Feather Step can't find it. Instead, Twig turns that kill around to the jungle. Fine, okay. Stays aggressive, though, at least looking for the steal. I'm going to find a little bit of poke, won't find the buff. Will maintain his life, which is the important part. Well, that was a very clutch rotation there from Variety. Goes to help out his jungler, and neededly so, right? I think Adapting definitely wins that 1v1 if he's left to keep going, get his cooldowns back up, but because the outwash comes in, Adapting couldn't quite close gap to get that last feather step off, and ends up going down and giving the return kill after a nice blink from Captain Twig. Now we're sitting at 1-1. Of course, first blood, a little bit more valuable. Adapting hits level 5 first, but a Hebo at level 5 can be very scary as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, we, it's been a while since we've seen the Hebo around, but oh no, Variety, not again. Oh, well, there's going to be the knock-up from the Kraken, knock-up from the Awilish, and there's not much more you can ask for there. It is clean execution coming from the Leviathans, and like you said, another kill. On the variety. And that's about as free as it's going to get also. But here we see a little bit of a wow. question from Yargor. 
does get the mount on archery off of Panic Cat. Doesn't seem like there's any kill potential unless Wrong Yu wants to go in for the ult, but even that, not a lot of damage unless Captain Twig wants to get involved. Yeah, they're throwing some poke out there. Twig is just is around he the corner. Go with health bars, and Twig? that's gonna be the dash from Panda Cat. He wants the kills. Now Twig is here. What's he gonna be able to do? Alt knocks on two, gets some low damage, just a little shy from the Kings, just a little shy from the Leviathans and duo lanes. They walk back limping, but they're still alive and they make it out of that fight. Wow, I mean, you could tell duo lane was going in, they were getting aggressive, and Twig's like, not yet. I'm baiting. Like, <laughs> not yet. I need them to overcommit. Couldn't find it. Tings has to watch out for that dash. Remember, Sheen Token follow you wherever you go with that dash, but is not going to find any solo kill opportunities, even with Explosion of Souls ready. Not too much burst damage in this build just yet. The Bancroft's down helps, but I'd say two or three items is when you're really looking to go in consistently for those 1v1s. Maybe one of the most, like, in the list of top five hardcore ultimate names, by the way, right? Like yep. Explosion of Souls? For sure. For sure. It gives so much, too. Uh, th this is the thing. So we've seen this, and we saw it earlier in the Dragon set. Like, this is not... Uh, anything that happens with Shinto, unless he's getting a kill, it's it's not unexpected, right? Is right. he getting pressured? Yeah, okay. He is a little bit ahead, but that's maybe Shinto farm outdoing the fact that he is getting outpaced, or at least outcleared in lane by BMT. Adapting, wants to try and make up for some of that, get some damage onto BMT. Has Shinto coming up behind him? Ooh. What kind of aggression can they find? The answer seems to be none. Explosion of no souls. <laughs> <laughs> You, got, you, gotta, you gotta hit those to get the explosion of souls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could tell, right? You get the beads early on Tings. He's gonna jump out. We get to pull him back in. That's a kill. Ting says, I'm gonna just run. Like, I'm not gonna jump out. I'm not gonna give you that gravity search. So Shinto says, stand back. I got him. Once I throw this, <laughs> once I throw this on the ground, we'll get our knockup. We'll get the pull. He was too quick. Thanks to the Atlas of the Yellow River, Captain Twig made sure to get his mid laner out without even having to use that leap, put him in any sort of danger. And there was the explosion of no souls. He stepped up for the free throw and then it just bounced right <laughs> off the rim. And like, full confidence. We'll see it again, I'm, I'm certain. I wasn't admittedly expecting anything at level eight from him. Uh, but to see the aggression that's there, I I'm still a little worried, mainly because BMT has been on point with those axes. Oh, yeah. And I feel like all it takes is one stray axe from an ool and then a hebo to exist in the nearby vicinity, and that can usually spell the end of pretty much anybody's life. And that's the thing. So with no Guardians, no Warriors, like, base health scaling in this game, even the quote-unquote tanks are going to be shreddable towards yep, that late game. For sure. I do look at the dive... Specifically, like Shinto is trying to illustrate, he might have something going for him. Adapting, joins him in the jungle, misses the knockup, is going to have to retreat on Suku. But the knockup, great from Twig instead, finds Shinto alone, but Shinto goes in. Shinto kills him out now, needs a little bit of help. His team bails him out from the 2v1, takes care of Variety, but can't quite save him. Gets a two for one trade, kills off the right hand side of the King's map. Yeah, that's going to be it. What a rotation. And I didn't expect to see Yarkor. Riding through all the way over from duo lane, had some pressure, didn't really get much value from it. But that's the benefit of Shinto's damage. I did not expect the explosion as well. That's those soul spikes will get you, right? You you expect, oh okay, party trick comes in. That's some some tick damage. We have to watch out for that. Oh, the illusion comes in. You can you know jump inside of me. I can't do damage, but eventually I'll be able to kill him, right? No, that explosion damage does a little bit too much if you're not prepared for it. And Captain Twig feels the wrath there. And th that was a beautiful explosion of souls. Used it to force out Crushing Wave. Captain Twig has uh -oh. Blink, has to go in, but thanks to Shinto once again, Captain Twig might be dead. Yeah, this is actually going to be dangerous. Looking at the map variety, BMT nowhere nearby. Twig's on his own good dash, dodges out damage. Yep. And one last hit is all you need. Five to two now for the Leviathans. Good combo from BMT. This might end up actually getting turned around. Shinto's looking for the damage. He wants that fight, and BMT. He has to jump away to stay alive. Yeah, you gotta be careful anywhere near Maman Brigitte when she gets that damage online. The stun, I think, is the most annoying part of that kit because if you're not keeping track of how much, you know, fire she has left, you're not gonna be able to oh, find it for a variety. variety tossed up and slam down, crack it into gravity surge once again. 04 for this outwash. Just cannot exist over in this lane. It's I mean, no offense to the Kings, no offense to Variety, but admittedly, that's been the tale of the last, like, five weeks. Yep. It feels like, hey, let's just go right, bully Variety. 
He's 0-4. You he got a two-level lead for fine. Okay, it's allowed adapting to play pretty much however they want. I mean, this entire right-hand side of the map, most of the engagements we've seen have been the Leviathans walking into the King's jungle and admittedly not really getting that punished for it. I think that first initial attempt, we saw them get punished. That's where those two kills come from. It feels like a, a big riding of the ship. Uh, since then... They've not cared, and we're not even talking, like, main power spikes for the Maman yet. I mean, put yourself in adapting shoes, <laughs> right? You're, you're a three-in-one Awelix. You've got Jotuns and Hyd Tier 2 Hydras online, and there's an Alpwash with zero FISD and no beads in solo lane. I'd be living in that yeah. lane, right? There's no... Until he gets Breastplate online, I'm not going to stop ganking the Alpwash. Because where's the defense? It doesn't exist. Shinto... Explosion of Souls actually does force out the crushing wave, and I think Twig was right to do so. Oh, Quig pulled in, stunned out, forced to use the Undying Love. And this is, I think, Krelly, really what, what, what binds the Leviathans together, what has given them a lot of their success. It's this little bit of aggression, right? Shinto gets a big win against Twig, and they're not letting that lie anywhere else. They're getting a big win against Quig. Now that they've pushed out two and forced out ults, Open Gold Fury, free reign in the jungle, and a hefty lead for 10 minutes in. Six to two for the kills, and just shy of 4,000 gold in their favor already. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like they're going to stop anytime soon. You know, you called it early on. This is either going to be a snooze fest or a bloodbath. It was looking like a bloodbath from the double blink, and the Leviathans have kept that aggression <laughs> up, right? They, it's very rare that we're going to see those blinks on cooldown, adapting, setting up a gank on a variety at the blue buff. Is he going to go in by himself? Is he going to wait for Final K? Doesn't really matter. I don't think this blue buff is going to belong to him unless that Hevo rotation gets called out. And now Captain Twig could be a target. Well, it's going to be a 2v3. BMT's in the neighborhood as well. They see the 2v2. Fine, okay. Pops some move speed. Goes forward. Kraken off the mark. Doesn't get a lot of damage there. Opwash throws out the corpses. That's going to create a big zone. Fine, okay. Now in a dangerous spot. Has to play carefully. Knock up good from Twig. Gets him against the wall, but... Are the camp, no is the way. camp helping or hurting? It's helping. Fine, okay, keeps him alive. Shinto, meanwhile, has been juggling three on his own. He's going to go down, but he buys his team so much room and an invade. That is ridiculous that Fine, okay, lives there. Twig didn't have the blink. Still is chasing, though. Has crushing wave. Doesn't seem like a 1v1 that Twig really wants to take. All it takes is one feather stab, and there's no way you're making it out of this one. That's exactly what's going to happen, but Quig's nearby. Undying Love is available. Twig's going to get out of here just fine. That's what you got to worry about, man. You, you get crushing wave feather step. You can't win that fight, and that's exactly what Adapting was waiting for. But look at this. Cannot believe what I am seeing. 4,000 gold down, and the Kings are starting up the Fire Giant. They have to make a big play. Pull goes for In a the pull. Wrong you Ooh. looking for two. Does miss the knockup from the FG, but keeps them engaged. Adapting's around. The rest of the Leviathans rallying soon. Wrong you keeping them engaged just long enough. Might actually have the root for Variety to keep him engaged. Low health healing from Quig is going to be necessary. The Kings are going to get out of that one. Admire the attempt, though, Trelly. They find a big kill, and they're looking for something to pull them into the game. Yeah, I mean, it's just a check. Hey, do you guys have ward coverage? If you don't, we're going to go in for the 50-50. But the second uh, – actually, they didn't want to go in the 50-50. The second wrong you shows up, they go, we need to get out of here. We do not want to telegraph this pull that hard. Wrong you's got plenty of tank stats. Life of the party just to pull back in Quig and see – if he can stall out anything for adapting, because he was nearby with Gravity Surge. One knockup from Fire Giant, that could have been an aggressive play. Only Fury spawns in here shortly. And Adapting's on the left side of the map, which he hasn't been very often. If you've been paying attention to yeah. a Wheelix, a lot of time spent over <laughs> in solo lane. Quig's nearby. A twig, rather. Doesn't seem like he's going to be able to find anything. That level 12 is big for a Hebo. I mean, you've got Doom Orb and Enchanted Spear. Not the most damage in the world. You'd like to get a beads, you'd like to get a full item online. Whereas Adapting, I assume he's working, yeah, almost on item number three. Just got a lot more gold in his pocket, a lot more farm to his name. Yeah. Not a 1v1 you want to take. Especially, I mean, even now, you know, with, well, I would say a full item ahead, right? The tier three plus another tier two. And still two, only 200 gold behind right now in pocket, at least, of what Twig's been able to pick up. So he's running the show as far as Adapting is. Uh, as far as jungle economy is going. And that's probably going to help out. Going to keep my eyes on it. Level 12 just now twicked over. Kicked over for Twig. And so we'll see if he gets that beads. Uh, like you're assuming. And I, I would assume so with the rest of this comp. And if he can also just survive in his jungle. Pyromancer's back up. We're going to have a Fury back up. It, it feels like maybe now we can enter some normal seat for what a 13-minute game should be looking at. Or looking like. 
And the Levi Leviathans still have a pretty massive amount of control. Where do they start to pressure that, right? I mean, you're all still, you know, levels 13 through 15, save for Rong Yu. Are you still looking for picks? Are you looking for objectives? Where do you group up? Now, you're definitely still looking towards objectives. Oni Fury just spawned in. Pyromancer is available. If you're the Camelot Kings, you're looking to play very defensively, but oh my great God. poke damage on to Shinto. Anytime you can cook up an axe like that, yeah, you're going to send it towards Shinto, towards just about anyone. Big Man Ting just showing exactly how much damage this new H Uller build can do. If you hit those Hydras procs, once you get the Fail Not crits involved, yeah, you could be looking at a one-shot potential. Of course, Shinto knows that damage and doesn't pop his beads. Next time, he might have to. <laughs> if that Fail Not's finished, you're not really wanting to gamble with that damage. But the Pyromancer is absolutely free right now. The Leviathans have no way of knowing this, but there are no Camelot Kings nearby, and... They're going to take the gamble, and it's going to pay off. There's no one even close. And this is the thing that, that is really, from my perspective, really fun to watch, right? When you have this many, I'm going to call them all carries, right? The mages, your, your ADCs, etc. Yep. I guess the one assassin that graces our, our presence. We get that plus the frenzies. It just feels like we're going to be looking at fast objectives, fast fights. If It's either over in the blink of an eye or we're watching a staring contest. As far as I'm concerned, they are three assassins in this game. Hebo and Maman Brigitte definitely count. <laughs> they are magical assassins, but the play style wow. remains the same. Fire Giant started up and all the Camelot Kings are here. Yeah, they're going to spot it out. Leviathan's got everybody as well, though. The full five on five. FG still going. No one's dropping it here. The fight's on and the Kings are going to walk in and take that away. And they're going to take Wrong Use Life along with it. Twig trades it out one for one, and now the aggression is there. Jump in from adapting. He's looking for the cleanup kills. Call him the janitor as he comes in. Three on the Kings. Wiped out. Yeah, Variety trying to run away here. Does he have the damage? No. Panda Cat going to pick that one up. All but Big Man Ting's fall with the Fire Giant buff. You got it on one. Not sure it's going to be worth it. I mean, Captain Twig uses Crushing Wave to confirm. Sure, you got to go for the steal attempt there. I respect it, but that's a great kill tool, right? Look at the Aegis bar. There are only one. It's Panda Cat. Everyone else would take the full brunt of that damage on the side of the Leviathans, but he had to use it to confirm Fire Giant. So once you lose that big tool, the rest of the fight sort of falls apart. Adapting was always in the right place. And of course, the, the damage chase down potential that the Leviathans have with all their sustain. Look at this, though. Tings. Does he even have mana for a full combo? I mean, he, he maybe has a, an Axe 1-3, and that's about it. Let's see if that can one-shot. Shito just beats just in case he was worried about the damage. So, hey, miss an Axe, get beats. I'd say that's worth. <laughs> Especially, I mean, I, I give Shinto some credit. BMT has not missed many up yeah. to this point. That one was pretty wide, though. And unfortunately for Shinto, he's not going to have that. Fortunately for Shinto, it doesn't seem like his team really cares about being defensive right now. They play aggressive. They force the Kings back in the jungle. Now they're stepping up to the Fury. Oh, my God. And they burn it. They don't have a frenzy for that one. That's just good old-fashioned damage. They bring themselves up. 5,300 gold, 5,700 experience, six kills in the lead. We might be calling that oh seven in goodness. just a second. Fine, okay, cleans up one. Wrong you. Maybe looking for a stun. And they are not going to give the Kings one iota of peace if they can avoid it. And they're going to step up, take the beacon. Leviathans knock down a tier one in right and continue to put pressure on mid. Yeah, Yarkor just did not have the Aegis available. Gets cracking, gets absolutely destroyed, all the while adapting, split pushing over on left. So towers are dropping like flies at the moment. I think Twig has some idea that adapting's nearby. That's why he's not stepping out of this tier two tower. Definitely a 1v1 he'd be happy to take. Speaking of 1v1s, Shinto certainly Man. winning the 1v1 over on right variety. Ults just to try and clear the wave. And that's the benefit of this pick. You, you can you can play like a second jungler. Shinto just sits around, looks for his 1v1, and that's the play style of a uh, magical assassin, so to speak. Friday just wants some farm. Too. Like, he's, he's not even trying to do too much. I guess he was pushing the tower. But he's two levels down. He's one in six. Uh, they're just bullying. I guess for the sake of bullying, but that's kind of what winning is in this game. Also a three-level lead in the jungle. Now that we've got a little bit of a slowdown, you want to talk about the saddest party ever? No one bought their brew but Maman. Shinto was the only one that got some Baron's brew. No one else picked it up. Baron didn't even show up to his own party. And at that point, it, admittedly, that's kind of like doing a favor, right, for, for, <laughs> for Baron. Like, lore-wise, that's the equivalent of, like, telling your boyfriend that the, the woodworking project he did for his first time ever, like, that chair's real comfortable. <laughs> that, that is... <laughs> I imagine... 
I imagine that makes sense considering I don't know the lore, but it just seems like such a stretch. But only one brew. That's what matters. A lot of party punch, though. I guess that makes sense. Maybe so it's you're battling to balance somewhere. Yeah, it's a different kind of party at that point. Still three tier two towers to go. This 8, is a very gold. It's a very slow fire giant because you remember, Tings is the one who has it. Yeah. No one on the Leviathans do. They still knock down those tier one towers, but they didn't want to overcommit. They didn't want to step into the tier two because they don't have that fire giant buff. They don't have the increased damage, the regen. I mean, <laughs> Tings is like, hey man, I'm 2-0. I've got Fire Giant, Red Buff, I'm feeling kind of good. Like All things considered, it could be worse. This next Fire Giant is going to be interesting. That was also a close call. I think if Twig gets caught out, if Adapting sees him backing there in the jungle, I, I anticipate bad things are about to happen. Hardcore is going to get out of there. Uh, it seems like the Kings are in a good spot for, for their retreats. Relics are in a good spot going into a fight. But, Charlie, it, it really is, you know, just... Economic right now. His gold leads through and through in favor of the Leviathans. There's so many power spikes over there. So if you're looking at it, I'm surprised we're having this. At, you know, essentially, it was going to be a 20 minute, 21 minute fire giant fight. But can the Kings afford to step up to it, or are they going to have to play back, play defensive? I mean, I think you send Yarkor over to left lane. He doesn't contest this fire giant. I think you send Twig to do the same play, blink it, and go for a steal because his life. Unfortunately, it's not worth much. A level 16, 1 and 3 Hebo with 3 items. You know, I talked about the value that Crushing Wave could get when Final K Adapting and Shinto don't have Aegis. Let's throw Wrong Yu in the mix as well. He also doesn't have it. It's just not worth it at this point. The damage is not going to get value. So, that's not the call though. The Camelot. Okay, now they're deciding. It's a little bit too late at this point, but they are going to run over the left lane and try and grab some farm. Yeah, I think you just send everyone over to left lane. Grab a gold fury, push a tier one tower, get as much gold as you can. It, it seemed a bit indecisive though, right? Mm -hmm. Why is Yarkor in mid lane at that point? Unless they said, can we fight this? Can we go in for a steal? At this point, you're not even going to be able to get too much farm. But Camelot Kings are going to group up over and right and try and defend this tier two tower <laughs> all the while. And again, Camelot Kings have no way of knowing this. Adapting and Shinto are nowhere near at the moment. Uh, fight wise, a lot of this is going to ride on one good Whirlpool, maybe wrong use engage. Uh, of course, whatever Panacat can do from the back line. A lot of good damage. And you've got some crit in the build for him, so all it takes is one caught out mage, one caught out squishy. Hell, just variety apparently <laughs> steps up, and it could be demise for the Camelot Kings. It is 3v4. About to be 5v5. We got two in the jungle, spotted out, I think, by BMT. They're pushing mid. And it's the slow roll game around the Tier 2 towers. Minions cleared out easily by the Kings over and right. Mid-Tier 2 deleted in an instant. Now the Kings have to figure out what play they want to run from their playbook. Tier 2 goes down. They have to fall back to Phoenix line. It's all the plays they can go for. Just gave up the towers at this point. There was some decent poke. Variety recognized, hey, I've got some decent burst damage. But he also recognized Panda Cat hurts. He's got Demon Blade, he's got Deathbringer, and he can crit you from halfway across the tower. So definitely a smart call just to give that one up after the damage check. Big Man Tings goes mid, tries to 1v2 and at least keep that tower alive. But considering Shinto and Adapting both had Blink, both had the ability to dive, and Shinto's holding an alternate timeline. So even if you do get a miracle 2v1, you're not even able to get that kill, right? He's just going to come right back. I think it was the smartest call just to give all of that up. In the meantime, Titans will be unleashed, though. This could be big for the Leviathans if they decide to push up with their Titan over on left and, you know, use the whole way and try and break the base. Not like they have a Runic Bomb available. And if you think about it, their range damage isn't the best either. But they still should be able to get some decent poke towards the Phoenix. They aren't grabbing it, though. They, they have not set up for that beacon. In fact, they're leaving it for a reason. Maybe they just want to push a little bit later on. Do you think, are they, so are they waiting to push for the Titan or are they thinking that they could maybe end the game and they don't want to deal with that Titan running down left lane as of right now just to make sure that they're in the right spot for it? I assume they're gearing up for one big push where they can end off that Titan call and they're, they don't feel like they're ready for it just yet. Maybe some upgraded starter items, Panda Cat just got his online. Typhon's Fang picked up her final case. So there are some big power spikes coming through. But Fire Giant runs out in a minute. So either A, they're going to push in right now, grab the beacon and go. Or B, they're waiting for one more Fire Giant attempt. Then they grab the beacon and then they go in for the all-in. All right, now, if they spawn them in, the Titans are on the left. If they take this tower, that's going to shift it up. Looks like it would be mid. 
And so it's definitely going to change a small dynamic of that piece of the game, especially with Variety pushing over and right. Tier 2, oh my god, just gone. BMT might follow. Good knockup from Adapt. Good catch by. The leap. And like you said, goodbye to BMT. Now a 4v5 base defense. And the Kings looking down the barrel of an aggressive Leviathans. Shinto, pressure in mid. Not too much that he can go for. Throws out the souls. Does not quite find it. Forces out the ult from Twig. Twig still takes half his health in the process. Just trying to get away. Adapting once that fight. Can't quite dive the Phoenix for it. Left side, three of the Leviathans get aggressive. There's going to be a frenzy pop there looking for it. They find Quig. Oh my god, the damage is good. Not enough to find the kill, but enough to force the ult. Phoenix sending about one third of its health. Now you've got all five Levi's. They step forward. Need a few stray autos. I don't feel confident stepping under the eyes of four healthy kings. Shinto blinks in. Shinto wants a kill. Shinto is looking for Twig in the back. Finds a lot of damage. Not quite again the, the kill. And they can't get the bird either. A lot of aggression from the Leviathans. And not a lot of payoff. Wow. I mean, that is about as good of a start as you could ask. The 2-0 and Ular, the beacon of hope there for the Camelot Kings, gets just destroyed in mid lane by adapting, pulls the beads, gets the knockup. He doesn't even have the chance to jump away because the gravity pull is still available. That gravity surge would have just yoinked him back. So Tinks has to accept death willingly. And adapting just to use blink. He's still full HP. He's got beads. But that was not enough. And now Captain Twig chasing in the jungle. What's he going to find? Honestly, not much. The rest of the Leviathans are heading back over to right lane. So this is the play I thought they would make last time. Just group up, push down left. You know the Leviathans are going to be on Fire Giant at the moment, so try and get as much farm as you can. But look at this. Shinto adapting and wrong you. They're not over at Fire Giant. They're looking for an ambush. Well, all the while, Fine OK is doing Fire Giant with Panda Cat. They're going to try to chase this one down. Yeah, they step over a ward, adapting. Would have needed to jump over the wall. Their blinks weren't there. Also turns out you just straight up don't need three members of your team to get the FG when you've got crit. That's exactly what Panda Cat and Fine OK are able to do, plus maintains the Kraken. Now they're going to cap this beacon. We're going to be sending the Titans straight down mid. That's going to give the Leviathan something to push with. Fire Giant strong on all five. Trelly, three speed buffs as well, considering they've invaded and stolen away one from the King. So you've got it everywhere you'd want it. And the pressure is on the Kings. We'll go ahead and call it 15,000 gold down. 13 to 4. This is The situation's getting dire. It definitely is. They were able to defend once, though. Can they do it again with a Titan running them down no less? I mean, Variety has some great tools to keep the minions out, right? You, you drop empty the crypts, that is good enough to stop one engage. The issue is that the Leviathans have so many tools as well now. They, they've got the Titan on their side. They have the ability to split push. No beads on Twig for 37 seconds. That should be able to be stalled out. I don't imagine Leviathans gear up for a siege just yet. But the biggest issue is who's going to be shredding through this this Titan. You've got Big Man Tings. You've got Yarkor. Double ADC is online. But those beads are just so impactful. We've seen adapting be on point with this Awelix. Nobody wants to get pulled back in. This Chaos Titan shouldn't be too much work for the Leviathans. And it won't be, and this is where King's defense, or maybe just defensive strategy, is going to come in handy. Having a couple of mages, having an ool is going to be helpful. Jelly, they're not going to have much else outside of that. The line of scrimmage is right at their Phoenix line, and everything in the jungle, it might as well just belong to the Leviathans. Now they get the reset. They get to breathe. Two minutes. You've got one bomb in pocket. Is this a spot where the, the Leviathans can feel confident going for a Phoenix? It seems like they're focused on left. I mean, you'd think so, but they just sent the Titan in essentially to die all the while. I think Final K just cracking Variety for fun. Variety's obviously going to heal that back up. Don't really see why that happened. Because Final K never has the damage to 100 to 0 anyone anymore. He's more tanky than anything, and there wasn't any follow up either. Maybe just trying to find a Beads, a Relic, doesn't end up happening, and now you don't have your Kraken for your Siege. And the Titan's been dealt with. I think the Camelot King should feel pretty confident about defending this. Well, they're holding on right now. You've got Fine OK stepping forward. Again, a lot of auto attackers here. A couple of stray shots from Panda Cat. Got variety low, but Quig's healing. He's done a lot for them. Defense holding up true right now. BMT able to hit him from far away. 
Doesn't seem to be too worried about it. Phoenix, left side, half health. Mid is getting looked at by adapting. Shinto is kind of hovering in between the two lanes, unsure where to go. And that uncertainty is really coming true in the actual objective siege. 15,000 gold. And yet not able to crack the base open just yet. Kraken's going to be coming back up, though. Could open up an opportunity. Shinto dodges out on BMT's abilities. Maybe it's the opening there. It's going to be wrong. You up into the coffin. Pulls in Quig for a stun. Whirlpool's there. Forces out the ult. Kraken just after some damage is there, but not enough to get the kill. And Quig walks out of this one. Healing still going to be available for the Camelot Kings as they maintain their Phoenix line. They've got the healing. Quig is going to be able to heal back up slowly but surely. Only 25 seconds left on this fire giant of Leviathans. They've got half of a Phoenix to try and cook through here, but it has been so slow. No real burst, just trickle down damage from Panda Cat. Remember, Shinto's got the blink, he's got alternate timeline, but Variety just keeps peppering damage in. Nothing you can do about it. Minions here, and they pop as much as they can. They want to go out, but Variety drops the ult to clear the wave, and the fire giant disappears without much pomp or circumstance. The Leviathans have to back away. Jolly, it's not going to be empty-handed. They can strip the entirety of the jungle, including a Fury that's about to come up. But that goes to show, aggressive and, and as ahead as this comp is, Sejin's going to struggle. And I got to see something. Yeah, Quig still has not stacked up. I believe the Sturdies do. He's had to hit just eight instances of CC. That's all he's been able to hit so far this game. It's been very defensive. I watched him hit a kiss and saw it go up. I'm like, you're about to sell that item before it's even evolved <laughs> at this point. You're not going to be getting the benefits. But... The real issue that from that is there's not much CC on the side of the Camelot Kings. It's going to be axes from Big Man Tings and knockups from Twig. That's about it, right? I, I have, You can say Quig's got the CC, but he's only hit eight kisses this whole game, like aggressively. <laughs> this has been, hey, I'm going to undying love for my team. I'm going to provide that movement. I'm going to provide that healing. But the hard CC, the, the ability to stop the Leviathans from their push, it's just variety. It's damage. That, that has essentially been it. And Levi's got to be careful. We're at that point of the game. These death timers can get kind of long, and they've got an aggressive comp on the Kings. It is not light damage coming out from them. One misstep could cost you your entire lead, and if they can knock down a Tier 2 for the Kings, it could cost you the game. Fire Giants up and enhanced. Pyromancer's being looked at as well. rongi has been the initiator, looking for a lot of those pulls. It's that, or maybe the Whirlpool. All five kings are in mid. All five kings are retreating, and they are spotted by every single one of the Leviathans. So that's going to give Pit advantage over to Levi's. And Charlie, they're, they're on the cusp of the fight. Leviathans start at the Fire Giant. It's getting low, cracking a little early, but they still manage to secure it. Now they got to get rid of the fight afterward. A lot of damage is good onto BMT, adapting, waiting for the leap. Tries to go in, finds exactly what he needs. It's the jungler on the Kings who falls first, followed immediately by his solo laner. The chase is now on. Leviathan smell blood in the water, and they have the FG to back him up. Split up, mid and right. Phoenix Siege is going to start up again. But you don't have the strengths that you had here if you were the Kings just a few seconds ago. Big Man Tanks is returning a lot of damage, but there's just five bodies on the side of the Leviathans. You can't damage down everyone. Finally, the base is broken. One Phoenix down, adapting. Takes a little bit of poke, but so much more is returned. And Tanks, he's got to go back to base. Right side Phoenix, mid Phoenix, all gone in a flash. Titan seems to be the next target. Wrong you leads the way. Not a lot of ults to work with if you're the Leviathans adapting. Went to left side Phoenix. They don't have him to dive, but they've got more than enough to get the job done. Strike one, and the Leviathans find themselves the first win of this set. I mean, not a bad end to the game, Gore. They played this very safe, but 15 to 4, 15,000 gold lead. You got to think the Leviathans should have been able to end that one a bit sooner, considering how dominant they were across the map. I didn't see anyone with a lead. I mean, Big Man Tings was about even for a bit, and that was about it. Everyone else was playing from such a deficit. Captain Twig, a full level down at times because he was lacking so much farm. But this game still goes to 32 minutes. I mean, their defense was solid. It was just the engage that the Kings were just lacking. Even on a god that or going against a god that should not be finding a whole lot in that lane as well. Yep. I feel like Variety got a little bullied. Unfortunately for Twig, that also meant he got a little bullied. I mean, we saw countless times the first 10 minutes 
three of the Leviathans were just in the right side jungle of yep. the Kings, and they didn't feel any pressure. So like you said, they maybe get away with murder early on, and that just translates into a relatively snowballing game for them. Still takes them uh, over 30 minutes to break the base, but they get it done. They're up 1-0. We'll see if they can continue that streak or if the Kings have something else to offer us right after this quick break. Far from the rest, now what you used to Okay, the same what you used to 
That's right. If you go over to youtube.com slash smite pro today, you can catch up on all the behind the scenes content. And even if you miss out on some of our content days that we've had with our pros, when we bring the teams or the individual roles in for all kinds of stuff. You can check out all of that there again on youtube.com slash smite pro. We got tier list, team check ins, role queues, waiting rooms that we do every single week uh, in between all of this stuff. And then our daily recaps we've also been uploading at the end of each and every one of our days here for SPL content. So make sure you go check all that again on youtube.com slash smite pro. If you miss any of the games, you can also go to youtube.com slash smite vod just as an extra little shout there. So make sure you go and check out those two channels. And here in game one, Myth, this was. A lot of fighting very early on in the game, and it kind of went about how you were breaking it down towards the end of the desk, which was this is going to be a difficult combination of teams for sieging more than anything. You can see the difficulty that we have for the Leviathans in those late game sieges, even given the massive amount of gold swing that they had in their favor. Yeah, but once you have that amount of gold in your favor, eventually the base will fall, and I think that's essentially exactly what the Leviathans were banking on. Look, we are the only team with an assassin right now. We get to start off every single fight on the map, and that's going to be our bridge pick to put our mages in a better position, uh, and then once we get to that siege, although it will be difficult, eventually those towers, those phoenixes will fall, and the Leviathans execute on that plan very, very well. I thought Adapting had himself a phenomenal game here on the Awilish, just got to set pace essentially for the entire game. I thought there was going to come a point where all these mages on the Camelot Kings or, or maybe the Ul will have one-shot potential that Awilish would have to slow down her game. Uh, simply not the case. Adapting said uh, Blink knockup is just good, and here's the thing about your damage output. I'll feather step it, and, and so often he was able to do exactly that. Leviathans seemed to me... They just wanted to play that early a little bit faster than the Camelot Kings were willing to do, or even capable of doing. I know you could just look at it and say, okay, well, 615 for adapting, 142 for Captain Twig. Must have just been a, a jungle gap. Yes, but there's nuance, right? Twig's on Hebo. That's not a great matchup into the Awilish, and it also takes a whole lot more time to scale up. So I think if we look at it compositionally, Leviathans chose slow lanes and then got themselves a fast jungler to speed up those lanes. Camelot Kings chose slow lanes and chose a jungler that was also slow. Yeah, so the Camelot Kings not able to ramp up to that point where they could really match the DPS output on the Atlantis Leviathans. And, and I just got to say, we've now seen four games of it. I don't know if we'll be seeing very much Maman after this, after today and probably even after this game, which is how strong a performance that's been shown through. Sure, the damage numbers aren't astronomically crazy this game, but the 1v1 potential that Shinto has had in, in some of these fights, we saw in a couple of the highlights yeah, where he's half HP, already got hit by a knockup crushing wave coming from a Hebo, and he turns around and wins the 1v1, hell, even a 1v2 at that point. This god has just shown that she's going to have an explosive start to her, her allowance, allowance, that's the way, into competitive play. And so far, I believe it's 4-0 and zero right now. This god, Maman Brigitte, is really popping off on her debut. And what I'm seeing from Amon in particular, which is making her incredibly difficult to deal with, is even if you know you're going to kill her. There, there are engagements where you say, doesn't matter what Maman Brigitte does, I'm going to take her down at the end of it. She could dash into me. When she dashes out, she's dead. When she's dashing into you, you're probably losing at least 50 to 60% of your HP so long as she hit her two first. And she just sits in for the, the entire duration. So you can take her out. 
but she's going to take you down pretty low with you, or with her, or just take you out straight up. Her 1v1 potential, of course, just incredibly high. So finding an answer to that, I think uh, essentially everyone's forefront of their mind in the SPL right now. What is the Maman Brigitte counter? I haven't figured it out yet. Killer with CC, but that's everything, right? That's that's Every time a good character comes out in Smite, I swear, every plat five and up mid laner or, or support <laughs> player is like, bro, I'll just hit him with CC, and they're going to die. That's true for everybody, guys. Getting hit by CC is not an exclusive counter matchup to anything in Smite. It's just good. I've got the answer to the global. It's globals. Globals. Got to be globals. Yeah, you get it. She jumps into a global god, then you go to your fountain and she dies there. That, oh that's my simple. God. We figured it out. You, you bring her to the enemy team with a global. That's it. We found the counter. You've done it. We haven't seen an execution just yet. I'm only saying that because I've seen some pretty funny clips of Maman's dashing into like Apollo's or something like that. And then Apollo says, cool, I've got enough mana. You're coming back to fountain with me. Maybe that's the one true Maman counter. We'll see, though. If Maman even makes it through another game, Leviathans, we have to see if they ban this one out. Is Baba Yaga Athena? So far for the Leviathans, Chernabog, Opwatch, and Yamoja on the opposite side for the Camelot Kings. And it will be a Maman ban from the Leviathans. Worried about giving that one over to the Camelot Kings, so they take that one off the table. A lot of value still on the board here. Decision between Raijin, Poseidon. Okay, it's Poseidon. Okay, I, I only said Poseidon because he showed up on the screen. And my, my brain was like, I need to talk about what's on the screen. I would have never predicted Poseidon in that top slot. Thought for certain we'd be seeing the standards instead of the Camelot Kings. Straight away, grab themselves a rising pick in the Poseidon. Forces out Aegis's, controls objectives very well, has really, really good objective burn potential and secure, and some flexibility in roles. So the Camelot Kings not gonna show too much in their hand here. And maybe it's an answer of, there is so much on the table that are all very powerful that you don't necessarily need to grab one just yet. Go ahead and allow the Leviathan's choice on board. Levi's. Grab the rat pick early on. Flexibility again with both of those selections, Raijin mid or solo, rat, solo, or jungle. So hard to say, but I think probably just looking at adapting's pick there. Not even impressed to say maybe even Shinto's pick. Poor Leviathan. He is He's love very this good pick. On that pick. I, I remember jumping in season eight whenever I jumped onto the team, and immediately I'm sitting there going, Man, Shinto Raijin is pretty good. I think he went on like a 23 or 24 game win streak, something like that on this god. So wouldn't be surprised that went his way, though still, as mentioned, could flex over if you want to give it to Final Can the solo lane. Camelot Kings go with an old school combo, Najja Kakulkin for the Kings. And not just old school in the combo itself, but also this is something that Twig and BMT vintage. as a combo have been playing. Very vintage combo there for the Camelot Kings a major part of their game plan during their Season 9 Worlds run as well. So plenty of experience on this pick. Has revealed exactly where that Poseidon is going, though. We are looking at the solo laner. Variety going to be piloting the God of the Ocean. Imagine we see a good deal of Kraken on Totem, because uh, you're really not dealing with that Raijin too consistently. I mean, so often in that matchup, you'll see Kraken dropped on Raijin. Raijin instant channels his ultimate, says, I'm not getting CC'd, and then either walks out or just tries to take the DPS battle immediately afterward. Pressure lock-in for the Atlantis Leviathans on her in that third slot. This pick has really surprised me in the last few months and just how versatile it had been. I remember it was Vaporish Coast, one of the first ones that was really just going towards it super consistently. I said, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good pick. It's got great boxing potential. It helps out on objective burn, especially throughout the early game. It gives you a lot of kill pressure and chase down potential with Desert Fury, but it, it's a Vaporish Coast special, and that, that is just not true anymore. It, it's the entirety of the league. Every hunter essentially on check. Do you have it on her? If no, you are sacrificing pressure and lane. Leviathans answer it with a yes and get themselves a lane that they can play through pretty consistently now. You can now put the Rajin over in the soul lane and say, all right, you're, you're alone on your island. Farm up. You're not going to need help. I'm going to go play where our pressure is, and that's the duo. And if we win out on it, Gold Fury is going to be right around the corner. Now we go into the second wave of bands. Ganesh for the Leviathans. Morgan Le Fay for the Camelot Kings. Maybe trying to mitigate some of the potential double mage combo from the Leviathans. If this Raijin's going solo, what do you ban away from Shinto in mid? Or if you're taking Shinto's, uh, assuming this Shinto's Raijin, what mages can you remove from the solo lane in trade? It will be a Baron Somni on the other side. This time, the Leviathan's banning out. They're the ones who played it in the previous game, but Quig has gone to show that he also 
enjoys playing this god along with the Aphrodite for the mage supports at this point. So, take another hit at the support player for the Camelot Kings. Though, to may mention, the Aphrodite is still available if the Kings do want to go towards that one. If Quay wants to play it once more, where do the Camelot Kings go for their final ban is the question. Do they take another mage out and just maybe bank on this Raijin going mid and have more traditional souling warrior for Capri, a fine maybe. okay? You maybe ban the Kepri, as you call, to give them something that can't really counter the Najah Kakulkin combo. You'd have to be pretty quick, though, with the Kepri res to be able to pull somebody immediately from that Windfire wheels, but could be done. Just a very small window. Yeah, I mean, we've seen when Kepri is available, the Leviathans like that Kepri-Anubis combo, and that would round out their draft pretty well. Would still be a high-pressure duo lane with good kill potential. And then ignoring the Najah combo, right? Like, we, we're not going to utilize Scarab's Blessing defensively. You could utilize it a little bit more aggressively in a matchup like that, especially if they do take the Anubis for themselves. Would be able to win that DPS battle against both Poseidon and Kakulkin, likely. They go for the live shield, but I'm just talking myself into it. Let's go ahead. Get results oriented. <laughs> that answer will come shortly. The Camelot Kings ban out the Morrigan. I don't know what I want to ban, so I'll ban literally every god in the game, says the Kings. And, and they've done so very well. Aphrodite, though, for the Leviathans. I wonder now. I mean, that boost died potential pretty significantly. It's not as safe as maybe a Kepri could have been, but Rat with protections in your back line now with healing and a little bit of additional, uh, additional burst thanks to that back off could make it really difficult for Poseidon in particular to escape. Because what people don't talk about enough with the Aphrodite support is... The back off slow. I, I know that she's lacking a bit in, in AOE CC. She's got the single target kiss. But that slow makes it really, really hard to walk away from junglers, especially levels like 8 through 12. So decent potential there for the Leviathans to leverage pressure once those two, Rat and Aphrodite, get the link up. And then a Thoth to round the draft out. Seems like Smite year 10 is the year of no initiation just about i mean you get a little bit from the raijin taiko drum gonna get a lot of value here rat can do it a little bit too but the rest of your composition essentially relying on them whereas the camelot kings have got plenty of cc on their side i'm seeing multiple stuns multiple single target cc's high threat on deeds abilities the pluck from sobek the sash from naja i like both these comps a lot but it feels like this is a composition that could run into the same issues for the Camelot Kings as they ran into in game one, which is they might just be outpaced on map. I'm, I'm really concerned about the amount of pressure the Leviathans are going to have in the duo lane. And then anytime King Kennet locks in just about anything, it feels like I'm already concerned about it. But Rat, it's pretty high up on the tier list. I mean, Rat's almost like Thor in that instance. We know how good adapting is at Thor. My man took, what was it, like a two-year break, came back in his first game, got Thor banned top three. Like that, That's how much of an... Uh, an imprint he's left on all these young bucks in the SBL. <laughs> and now he's potentially going to do the same thing with Ratatosker this game. We'll see if he can live up to that same legacy along with this composition. But now we do get a little bit of a front line, at least of the Camel Kings, as mentioned, the Sobek. But we always talk about the, the double-edged sword that is Sobek. You go in for a pluck, pull somebody back, that's great CC, that's great initiation. But if they've got beads or if you miss that pluck, it's not a particularly good time for the Sobek. So if the Sobek does miss that pluck, is there enough surrounding the Sobek to try and bail him out of that tight situation? Uh, it depends. Did Spirit of the Nine Winds also rip through? If yes, maybe you can disperse the Leviathans. But if Sobek misses Pluck in like a jungle court or team fight, he's eating rat stun. He's got uh, the pillar sand right around him, so he's going to have to go immediately into the ultimate. Aphrodite might just chain CC as well. There's a lot of chase down potential. He might survive for a while. Walk himself out with the ultimate, the, the lurking in the waters, but Thoth also is the longest range god in Smite. So there is a lot of chase down potential, very volatile pick on that Sobek. But you, you can't play around the misses. You, you got to play for playing your own game and playing it properly. And if Sobek lands Pluck, I think the question is, is there enough threat in the draft around him to, to justify the Sobek pick? What are you throwing people into? Zephyr Tornado, that's pretty good. Whirlpool Cripple, that's pretty good. A Sash for Chain CC pretty good as well. So I think there is a lot of follow-up potential on the Camelot Kings. Uh, maybe enough to justify the Sobek. Hard to say up against the Aphrodite. We'll I'll have to see if the Camelot Kings can pull it out here in game number two and tie up the set. Or will the Leviathans go up 2-0? Let's jump right into game two with our casters. Thanks so much, J-Mac and Mifflin. That's right. Still Gore, Shelly, and of course, Doug. 
As we jump into this one, Trelly, a lot more standard, I would say, with maybe like an asterisk on it, because standard does have to envelop standard for the players involved, right? Naja, the Kukul Khan, uh, something the Kings have played, although we saw success earlier today. So maybe that's what they need. It is <laughs> shimmied after game one, just 1% in favor of the Kings. Unlucky. But 1% still a little further. And a little closer to maybe uh, the faith of the Twitch chat. How do you feel about this? I, I feel like the Naja Kukul Khan combo is like the, the tried and true classic for the Kings. Yeah, it definitely works. I mean, that's the reason they go back to it. But the issue, of course, is you have to find these key targets. And you have to hit a sash into an ult, get the beads down. Because they're not going to beads the sash. And you there's know? five of them. And then they, you, <laughs> you got to do it again, right? And can Captain Twig do that once, get out safely, then do it again on the same exact target and find that same level of success? Or are you even going to step forward if your beads are down? It's not as easy as, oh, I'm just going to ult someone, then you ult someone, we get a kill. It, it doesn't happen every time because there's so much, you know, room for outplay. Even so, even if Captain Twig gets someone up in the air, Adapting can go on Ting's, you know, CC him, try and kill him, make sure that doesn't happen. Shinto can do the same. They've got a lot of range themselves, the, the Thoth and the Rat, so it's not going to be as easy as it might seem, but I know that Captain Twig has went to this combo plenty of times because he knows how to make it work and he knows how to find success with it. Right there, we saw something that Quig won't be able to survive late game if it happens. That was a missed pluck. All they reset, though. I kind of want to ask, you know, we don't get to talk about the shards too often much anymore because they've been around for a while and you kind of know what they do. Are you surprised to see four Leviathans all going for cooldown? Uh, it depends. I, I think it really just is, is a play style difference. If I'm going Horn Shard, I'm using it for farm. You know, very rarely am I popping that shard to get a kill. It is more often than not, oh, I just cleared the wave, but I also want to do mid camps, or I just cleared mid, <laughs> but now I want to do my red. In that case, it can be a little bit differently, whereas Big Ben Tings, he's got Claw Shard, right? He wants more damage. He's going to pop that before he uses ultimate or when he drops a NATO down to look for aggression. Speaking of aggression, Shinto and Adapting have plenty of it. No blink available for the rat, but cooldowns come up. Yeah, the Acorn Blast might just do it. Yeah, Twig's low. What a great route. What a great shot from Shinto. Exactly what you need. The dash to get in range and a first blood just to clean it up. I mean, that's the range that Thoth can provide. I'm pretty sure Adapting had that kill regardless, but Shinto says, you know what? I'll invade and punish just to make sure that you can confirm that kill. A lot of damage oh, heading no. towards Variety. See if you got a Horn Shard here, maybe Variety goes down. But fine, <laughs> okay. Already used it. It's up at 15 seconds. You don't have the cooldown, but now there's a Ratatoska sitting by. Maybe adapting. Looks for an attempt at a kill. But Variety does have beads available. So even if an Acorn Blast connects, not enough to net a kill. And once this Najah is spotted out, you're probably just going to back up. Captain Twig comes to his solo laner's aid. Recognize, hey. You're not going to be in for a good time if Adapting wants to get aggressive. <laughs> I got your back. I've got a Blink Sash with his name on it if we need it. If Adapting hangs out over here the way he did last game, you're going to have a bad game oh, yeah. too. Yeah, no, they need to change it. Are you – I guess we, we already talked about it, and you had kind of already mentioned, like, the necessity, I think, that Beads has in this comp or into this comp that the Kings are running. But does it set the rat back to not have Blink? It feels like in a moment like that, if he has Blink, he, he maybe can get onto that Poseidon a little quicker. It definitely sets you back, 100%. I mean, every jungler wants to be able to go Blink and then just go uncontested, Blink in on squishy mages, Blink in on anyone with the, you know some hunters that with their escapes down, that sort of thing. But you just don't get that freedom all the time. Variety, it looks like he wants to go for like a possible crack in there. I think that's what he was looking for. He checked the blue buff, recognized Final K was already gone, and gave up on it. But yeah, Captain Twig, look what starting Blink got him, right? No no survivability. Now he's 0-1. Hasn't even used the Blink, whereas adapting, he used beads, and it was able to secure First Blood, give it over to Shinto. Now he feels a lot safer. Did Variety hear that? I don't know. Well, he's got to know now. Yeah, uses the beads early, avoids the knockup. Gets the Kraken out as well. Some good damage in return. Does not have any assistance, though, so Variety. Uh, that's a lot of flair, really, just to stay alive. But... Staying alive, admittedly, something he struggled with last time. Great performance and pulls out Adapting's ult as well. And that's the thing. Remember, last oh. time his beads were down. Shinto, no reason to be afraid. All he has to do is beads that wind fire wheels once the sash misses, so he's going to be just fine. 
But now there's no beats. Variety has to stay so far back. Next time, if Adapting connects that ult, it's almost certainly going to result in a kill. Maybe, if you're under tower, you can trade by dropping Kraken, but... About 2 minutes and 10 seconds of playing safe and avoiding CC. Not easy when you're in the solo lane. You know, I think that Adapting knows exactly where Variety is going to be without even checking a map. You know, he's either at his wave, he's at blue, or he's on his way to his wave. Like, that's 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 your solo lane pathing when you're a mage. You don't have teleport, you don't have survivability, you are just there to farm. Good pillar stun, Quig. Forced to use his dash to get away. That's the danger. It feels like Sobek is in an interesting is. spot. And right now, <laughs> yeah, interesting spot, Variety. Pushed up against the locker this time, right? And that's the that's the warning, you know, shove against the locker. Next time, it's shoving him into the locker. And if it happens a third time, it's stealing the lunch money as well. That seems to be the way the Leviathan's playbook versus the Kings goes. But look at the beads timer, Gore. Still 80 seconds. Did Adapting ult there? No. no. You got time for one more. If Adapting's playing his cards right, this blue buff is going to be getting looked at. Big Man Tings does have Aegis, not the beads. That stun means you're going to be taking the damage. Is the ult there, though? No. Final Judgment not available for Shinto just yet. If he had it, I'm almost certain he goes for it, but just does not have the cooldown yet. Luckily, he doesn't have to worry too much. Does use the beats oh, and avoids comes. the ult from Twig. Now you've got Adapting. Knockup's good. Root is better. And the Serpent of the Nine Winds goes wide. It's a clean pickup for the Leviathans. All it costs is Shinto's beats. Yeah, I mean, Tinks tries to peel at that point. Beads down on to fine, okay, and it looked like there was even an attempt at Big Man Tings' life with adapting going for the wraparound. Beads down, so does get a nice pluck there from Quig, fearing how much damage Big Man Tings could do. But you lose your Aegis, you lose this Naja once again. You lose Spirit of the Nine Winds, which isn't going to get too much value anyways because Windfire Wheels is down. Shinto's 1-0, and adapting 2-0, and not to mention the fact that Fine OK is still getting pressure over in solo. I will say, Variety does a great job pulling beads. Tycho Drums is still available though, so it's not like Captain Twig has the easiest time finding a gank over there. But that's where I'd be. If I'm Captain Twig, I've got a target now. There are beads down. Shinto adapting Fine OK. Pick one, make sure Tings is there. Need to pick up a kill here if you are the Camelot Kings. It's a pretty wide opening. We still have two minutes for a majority of those. So, if at 8.30 we, we look up and there has not been a kill for the Kings, something's gone wrong for Twig. It is going to be a slow pace. We recognize him as a farmer early on. We'll see how much that continues. Wrong you plucked, takes a little bit of damage, but it's Panda Cat on the on her. Goes for the ult, spreads some damage between Harcourt and Quig. Keeps the Kings pushed back. Got adapting in the jungle. No ult just yet for the rat. But all it takes is a little bit of aggression from the Camelot Kings, and Adapting will go in. No blink for him. Stun going to be good. That's a dash in. Pillar good. Oh, my God. The damage, the CC, and the chain. That follows. Leviathan's put a fourth on the board. Wow. Twig really wants this kill. He dives so deep. Gets the ult. Can Tings time it right? He certainly can. That should be the kill. And Twig gets to make it out just fine. I can't believe that worked out. Adapting, dives down, has to dodge out the crack. Can he find Twig, though? For Twig. Now, Twig knows he's coming. They were pings. But where can he go? So he oh, spots he see, him. He now sees him. you know where you want to go. Like a bloodhound following a trail, just has to find the final he example. He see him. Didn't oh, he see found him. him. Caught him right there. There's going to be the tower. Will go over to the tower, but assist picked up for Adapting. Small wins, I guess. Yeah, I mean, so Twig does the right call, right? He says, you know what? I am, first of all, we are killing Shinto. I don't care if I die. We are killing Shinto. I'm going in for that kill. End up trading. Variety wants to drop the crack, but here comes Adapt. Can't even drop it at this point. No, it's not available. He's got the juke shoes with the stun. Doesn't confirm oh, no. it. And then adapting too much damage from the tower has to dash away. Unfortunate for them, and and a little bit of luck there for Variety. Gets out alive. Just that last Tycho drum as well. Fine. Okay, held onto it. Patiently waits out the beads, but it's just a little wide, and that's the difference in damage. Yeah, maybe that might have been a difference in leveling order as well. If Adapting's going Dart and Acorn Blast, if there's no points in Flurry, oh, he does have a second point in Flurry, so even even with that second point in Flurry, not enough damage to confirm the kill. So, I mean, he did everything right. The only other play you could make is auto attack him one more time, which you almost certainly give uh, a shutdown kill to a revenge kill, yeah. not the kind of gold you want to give over towards Variety. It doesn't end up being worth it at that point. But, 
Gotta shout out Twig. He knew his team needed a kill. He knew Sheen Toad's beads were down. Goes in, sets up for Big Man Tings. They confirm that kill. And then he dies to tower. Says, you know what? I'm not giving this kill over to adapting. I'm going to juke if I can. Hopefully he doesn't see me. But if he does, tower's right here. Make sure that I get out with my life. Of course, that's a snowball effect of now that Twig's not here, we can invade blue buff and possibly kill Variety. They get the blue, don't get the kill, but Variety now has no beats for 90 seconds, which means Adapting might be spending even more time over in solo lane. It also makes it fun for anyone. Uh, at this point, if you're tuning in late in the afternoon, you look down and you go, okay, Leviathan's four kills. How does Adapting have two kills and three assists? The math doesn't add up there. <laughs> Uh, the towers are putting in a little bit of work so far. And a lot of that has been, whether it's the kill on to Twig or just now stopping adapting from getting aggressive, kind of goes to show how fast-paced last game was. Mm -hmm. in, in the lead, the Leviathans were able to pick up, which as of right now, it's about 1,200 gold. Uh, but also, in how quickly a lot of those towers were going down. I mean, it feels like the Leviathans uh, and the Kings, draft-wise and just playstyle-wise, were just pushing the pedal down to the metal. Now they have a little bit more of an opportunity. Stun, dart away. A lot of good damage on the twig. And adapting has Alt Shinto could shoot through the wall. I don't think that's going to be their goal. Mid camps are up. I was thinking Pyromancer because of the pace of the game and the pressure they're putting on right. But as of now, it's just a bully Tings, bully twig, and bully variety. Yeah, I mean, the stun from adapting did decent damage, but that was the ult from Shinto that goes in and almost kills Captain Twig, I'm guessing. That final judgment wasn't fully charged, maybe went for a half charge just to try and confirm the damage, see what could happen, but now Leviathan's going for an early, early gold fury. This was called out though, you can see the Camelot Kings are trying to get here, now it's just a bait, here comes the jump! Yeah, unfortunate knockup, not going to be there, Pillar. Gets the slow, but there's no impale after. In fact, Panda Cat and Wrong, you take a lot of damage. Twig, though, misses the Windfire Wheels, and so does the Serpent of the Nine Winds. It makes it so much easier for the Leviathans to turn that around. The jungle's left on an island, and they take care of them. Oh, and four now for the Najja, and not a lot left in the arsenal for the Kings to fight back. Yep, Purple Buff Invade is good. Quig forced to run away. All starts from a Gold Fury attempt, but more so just a bait from the Leviathans. And I love that aggression from Panda Cat. It wasn't, oh, you've got a, a stun wrong you setting up for me or adapting Zolting in. No, Panda Cat was the first one into the fight. He leaps in, trying to force that engagement. Variety jukes out the invade and punish. If all that hits, could be in trouble. Sends it in and Variety certainly going down here. Trades his life for a tier one tower. Not sure it ends up being worth it, especially if the Leviathans look towards this gold fear, which they are already pulling. So, yeah. I mean, you get some extra gold, but the Leviathans are not going to let that gold sit on the table for long. And at most, it strips them back down. I was going to say to a manageable lead, but now you push it back over 2,000. Leviathans with a comfortable lead. First comfortable lead we've got this game. And man, you gotta think there's just something, nothing can go wrong there. When fire wheels are available, so Fine OK has to play careful, has the beads. Doesn't seem too worried about what Twig has to offer. Especially if the Pythag is gonna give him some healing. Twig hanging around, no variety to work with. But is it all a bait to just make this prolong? Sash forces out the beads. Ult could come after, but no, Twig's gonna hold on to it. And Fine OK dashes away with a little under three minutes left on that CC immunity. Yeah, didn't seem like Final K was going to put too much respect. Yep, once again, they're going for the Fire Giant. Pull it Apex nearby. Has through the Cosmos, but Big Man Tings has the ult. He's got the confirmation. Someone's got to get in here. Adapting, spots it out, up into the sky. And where is he going to go? The Fire Giant's getting low. you got to go in now, and you got to get in. And the King's able to secure that, and they get a kill to boot. What a play. 12 minutes and 50 seconds in, they got five with FG. Yeah, if I'm adapting there, I don't think I make that call. That's a 3-0 shutdown he gives over. You're, it's a very low stake steal. It's a 13 minute fire giant. The most the Camelot Kings are going to get is a couple of towers from it. I don't think adapting's life is worth going in for that fire giant play, especially when Tings is there with ultimate. It's 1v5. Now, the tier 2 tower almost goes down, but the Leviathans don't quite grab it, and you don't get gold for almost score. That doesn't mean anything at this point. They have to retreat. And with that kill... And that tower in right, we're talking about an even game. All of a sudden, it's not a comfortable lead for the Leviathans. And they're going to have a lot of work to do to try and defend as best they can. Luckily, and, and Trelly, you know, when we look at it, you've got two stellar mages on the side of the Leviathan. So I'm not necessarily too worried about defense. But I guess the question is maybe where can they afford it? They've had a lead up to this point. Their kills have been looking pretty good. 
But is this something you want to see him, you know, just thwart the Kings if the, the Order team steps up to a Tier 2? Should the Leviathans just be there to stop them? A Tier 2, 100%. I wouldn't be surprised if they try and defend the last Tier 1 on the map as well over in left lane. I don't think the Leviathans need to be scared. They need to be respectful. You know, like, okay, your beads are down. Let's not step up. That's fine. Okay, now adapting. Your beads are down. You shouldn't step up either. We don't want to give free kills. But giving up free gold is a different story. You know, if you're not just going to be sending Shinto in to clear out waves, that just seems a bit silly. Wrong you and Shinto. Hanging around, unable to do anything, close gap or otherwise, to get to the Pyromancer. That gets picked up by the Kings. Gives them the slight edge. Ult down from Fine OK. Beads are going to be back in 30 seconds, so no CC for a half minute. Should be fine with a back to base. Doesn't seem too worried. Tier 2 on left. It's going to Panda Cat. So a little bit of that gold going to come back the way of the Leviathans. And Trelly, what we're watching is a tug of war right now. With the shot calling, uh, and more so maybe the efficiency of the Kings, right? When things go wrong, I mean, you got to look at it. 0-4 for, for Twig. Things have gone wrong. But only a level down. Not feeling too bad. They managed to get that Fire Giant... I guess the real question is, is was that enough or was it more of a band-aid to try and fix what the Leviathans have been doing? In fact, maybe it's not going to be enough of a band-aid. Adapting. I'm putting on the branches of Yggdrasil. Never mind. He falls back and it seems like, I want to say the rest of the team is going to do the same. But Bandicat and Rongyu in an aggressive spot. They've got Shinto behind them. They're stepping up to defend this tier one. Variety. Damage onto Quig. They've got Variety coming into the back. They spot him out. Oh, coming from Pandacat. Forces out the Aegis and the Beads from Variety. It's a small trade. Tier 1 goes down, but the damage seems to be good for the Leviathans. Panda forced the Aegis. Shinto caught in a crack, and Shinto caught dead. And now, with the engage from the Kings and low health bars, they might be able to push this a little further. And that's a beautiful play from Variety. That was a play about two minutes in the making. We saw Variety go for a random crack in on Shinto in mid lane uh, about a minute and a half ago. And now, with 80 seconds left on Beads, forced to Aegis, and Aegising the Kraken is nice, but guess what? You're still in a whirlpool when you land, and that just means the rest of the damage can come through. Shinto goes down, thanks to the second Kraken, but fine. Okay, steps forward here. Do the Leviathans really think they have an opportunity to fight? Does not seem so. The Camelot Kings are going to make out with their gold and just retreat. Grab the Fury as well. Definitely a good call. And the shot calling has been eye-opening here for the Camelot Kings, right? Maybe they didn't have the gold, maybe they didn't have the ability to truly fight, but you get one Fire Giant, you group up, get a pick, and then start snowballing those picks together, and now you got yourself a game. I mean, elite at this point here for the Camelot Kings. Now, yeah, one Fire Giant turned into the Pyro and a Fury and a Tower. Maybe two, even, at that. Uh, you lost that Tier 2, so we're, like you said, mostly well, in a sort of even-ish state. I guess 2,000 gold, 17 minutes in. It's something you got to work with here for the Kings to turn it into a, to a true lead. They might be able to do that. Beads have come back up for most of the Leviathans. Maybe wrong, you can get caught out, but also Aphrodite, Undying Love, probably not the best place to try and pick your battles. So I have to watch on what the Camelot Kings do and how well this is going to work, because last time it's surprise. 12 minutes, who else is going for a Fire Giant? 17, 18 minutes? Well, that's just standard SBL play. Leviathans are going to be grouped up on right just as well as the Kings. Tings over on Beacon, though, which means the Leviathans know there's no Cuckoo nearby. And they're going to step forward, whether that be for a Tier 1 tower or a fight in the jungle. Still yet to be determined. Seems like the Tier 1 tower is what they're after. No beads down except for wrong use, and they'll be up in 8 seconds, so it's not like Captain Twig has easy targets anymore. If anything, I'm looking towards Variety. He's been the one pulling beads. It hasn't been too much of Quig's plucks. It's been Krakens being dropped over walls to make sure those beads are down. And that'll make Captain Twig's job a lot easier. But now we just have a full-on group, and we're 18 minutes in, Gordon. The Fire Giant is the main POI on the map. And everyone is just surrounding, trying to figure out what you can do. I and mean, you got to think, poke-wise, Shinto should be dominating in a situation like this. You get a couple wards over the wall... That Hieroglyphic Assault, the damage is really going to start to add up, especially yeah. if the Camelot Kings don't know where the Thoth is. There's a whole lot of grouping for a whole lot of nothing so far. Pyromancer started taking down. Kings are going to secure that no problem. Right now, Trelly, the pressure's kind of on. You don't want to jump in if you're the Leviathans around a Pyro. 
Uh, if it means the Fire Giant would be lost next. And like you said, they've got the damage, and it's just finding the right opportunity. They also aren't working with the leads they had last game. I mean, you're actually behind, technically, if you're, you're Panda Cat. You're behind if you're Shinto. And what was, I mean, we were talking three level leads in the jungle and in solo last time around are either even or, or just one ahead for adapting. So it feels like there's a lot to go with. And it also feels like, you know, depending on Sobek is when these fights can truly be determined. But also, I have to give credit, Variety has been the engage for oh, yeah. a lot of these fights. Yep, he's, he's been the first one in trying to pull those relics to the team and trying to make sure that they're able to fight afterwards. And... This all does seem like a bit of a snowball effect from not only the, the, the fantastic fire giant play by the Camelot Kings, but also Big Man Ting's getting the last hit on the kill onto adapting. That certainly helps out, right? Now he's two levels up. Let's call it a level and a half over Shinto. He's going to be the first one of 20 almost certainly by the way that he's been farming. And this Cuckoo, best burst on the map. I mean, it's much easier to use than, than Final Judgment as well. You can't CC someone out of charging up Spirit of the Nine Winds. It's just coming out, whereas Shinto needs to sit there and charge up to try and match that DPS. The Leviathans, though, are the ones stepping forward here. Fine, okay, dashes as well. He's going to try and get some damage off of Twig. Not too much, but Quig is nearby, wants to find the pluck as well. Can't just walk around a corner. The vision on this Fire Giant is also a big deal. Seems like mostly Leviathan slanted towards the actual objective, but the Camelot Kings have the objective you know, around the Fire Giant pit warded, so they know where to watch out and also where Quig needs to set up for if he wants to find a pluck. And, you know, we haven't talked about it too much uh, since the initial update, but, like, this wide-open Fire Giant pit, like, there's just so much to cover, yep. so much to try and see. Uh, even now, I'm looking at it, Red Ward's the cover, like you say, the pit, and a little bit actually behind the pit for the Leviathans. It's going to be the kings who get to step up, deward just a little bit, and get themselves some vision. So a battle that's going to be won potentially on sight as much as it is on fight. A little bit of a staring contest, though, and this is where it gets a little rough because we started this pretty early, and so you're seeing, you know, level 18s, level 17s. Fire Giant, though, started up by the kings. Leviathans going to step in to try and fight it. Let's listen in as they do. This could be big, this could be big. Not so low, not so low, no. I got a big pillar, I got a big pillar on these guys. I just, don't, don't walk, don't walk, don't walk here, don't walk here. Kraken. Yeah. Yeah. Kraken. He I missed Kraken, he cracked the nothing. Let me bait Summer Clock, Summer Clock, can we fight we this? Can, we can. can we fight this? They're going to try and answer that question in just a second. They have an advantage. Good fight for the Leviathans, but more, maybe just going wrong for the Kings. Opens things up. Fire Giant still dancing, bouncing back and forth between them, Trelly, as Levi's full FG. Down to half health. Quick. Lurking in the waters, goes in, looks for a pluck, picks up wrong, you put the wall, the pillar, keeps him behind, and instead Quig is left out to dry. A kill for the Levi's makes this one a lot easier. Ults to work against, and they have the room to march forward. Fire Giant, just a little under half. Wrong you getting low, wrong you in a dangerous spot. All Tanks it takes has all more damage. Qu Qu Twig goes in, Twig can't quite find it. The CC chain is good. Tings, though, does exactly what Tings needs to do. Ults gets the FG, but he's lost three in the process. Now, can they can lose this out? Adapting, he's one hit away. Thank God for Shinto. And he comes in four from the King's Fall. They get the FG and trade out two. Isn't this what happened last time, Gore? It was, it was Captain Twig that stole it away last time, but it was just Tings with Fire Giant. Whereas the, Le the Leviathans are able to make out and get all the gold afterwards. I mean, this time it's a little bit better. Big Man Tinks is absolutely chunking, and I don't think anyone can step up to him at the moment. 4-0 on this Cuckoo. The ult, 1,300 damage to Panda Cat while also confirming Fire Giant. But if that's your sole target, I think adapting needs to change his strategy, right? If you're going through the cosmos, it's a little bit scary. It's very easy to pre-ult. That ultimate from adapting, right? You know you're about to get landed on. You drop Spear of the Nine Wheel sort of as your peel. But if the only issue on the Leviathan's map is killing Big Man Tings, someone's got to close gaps. Someone's got to CC this Kakulkan. He's got no Aegis, no beats for 100 seconds. They've got their mission. Let's see what they can do. They're grouped up. Left side. Oni Fury should be quick work for the Leviathans, and it's going to be. They've got double the kills, still technically trailing 2,000 gold, though that Fury's going to help out. Now they're going to try to find a little more variety. Oh, the he's gone. oh my god! 
god, the delete button from Shinto connects, and now it's an easy engage. Kukul Khan throws out the ult, Serpent of the Nine wins, doesn't connect, adapting, eats a lot of damage in the front, but the team is there to back him up and to save his soul. They're gonna take down the Kings, three now in an instant, and all of them on to Shinto, the mid laner coming up big. Yeah, big man Tiggs is running away. He's got the only bit of wave clear. He's the only way to stop the aggression here of the Leviathans. Titans marching down right, so no need to try and defend that. But your Phoenix, your mid bird, is what the Leviathans are after. And remember, Shito has so much range. I mean, you step up a little bit too far, invade and punish, and some hieroglyphic assault is going to be able to delete you off the map. And that's who I'm looking at. Big man Tiggs still with no relics for 40 seconds has to play this one safe, has to retreat, as the rest of the Leviathans are able to deal with the Titans over on right. Question is, can the Camelot Kings find something here? If the Leviathans stick around a little bit too long, there is chase down potential. There is a blink wind fire wheels from Captain Twig. Some good targets to go for as well. Let's see if he can find anyone, but no, he's clearing mid waves. Those Oni minions too threatening. Looks like the Camelot Kings don't want to fight this. Tings to hold on for another 70 seconds onto that fire giant buff. Don't know if it's going to be doing too much for him. Uh, now, Relic's back up for him and everybody except for adapting. So we maybe see a patient reset. Tier 2 and right is the last tower standing for the Kings. All three Tier 2 still up for the Leviathans. Charlie, we're 25 minutes in. The gold is virtually even. Experience at this point doesn't matter as heavily. Mainly seeing what you can in support and in jungle. That two-level deficit for Twig is still a big deal. It's kind of easy to forget that that was 24 minutes in. That we're, we're looking at uh, these sieges. You know, Tier 2 is taking a little while. This next Fire Giant, depending on when it goes down or how long of a dance, we're either talking enhanced or we're talking not. And that gives a lot of pressure. What goes so wrong? Is it just the usage of ults maybe a little too soon for the Kings in that last FG fight? Like, what do they change for the next one to make sure that they can, like, compete? I mean, at this point, right, the Leviathans got it very low. The Kings walked up, and they said, hey, we've got Cuckoo ult, right? We are going to confirm this at the very <laughs> least, and then we'll figure out what happens after. You know, you're not you're not getting too much value from the Naja. You're not getting too much value from the Sobek. Immediately, Quig gets deleted, but... Final Judgment gets used, so the Camelot Kings say, hey, we're down a man, but we have the superior burst, let's just go in. So yeah, they get Fire Giant, but they lose the engagement. Remember, they weren't really in a spot where they should have been fighting. It was more so just, hey, because we have Cuckoo, we're allowed to be here. I'm thinking that's the same idea, and the Leviathans have to keep that in their mind. If the Camelot Kings are stepping forward, yeah, it's great to kill the first person that walks up, but you can't get that Fire Giant below 50%. If Big Man Tings is nearby, it's just not worth it. You're just dishing up a free Fire Giant for the Kings again. You can see Dancing Pyromancer's going to be up just shortly after that Fire Giant. Three minutes until it's enhanced. So we'll see what the Leviathans choose to do with their time. And more importantly, what they try to do with Tings. How deep he is. They're playing aggressive. Dancing around in the jungle. Good vision. And a dash forward onto Variety. Damage is there from Fine. Okay, Whirlpool creates some separation. Tycho Drums tries to pull him in. All it's going to do is force a crack and adapting in the sky. Forced to fall back. Variety maintains his life. Loses both Relics and the ult. And that's the opening the Levi's need to step into the pit. And they're going to do just that. They're starting up the Fire Giant. But remember, it's not Variety they need to worry about. They're going to go in for Quig first. Take some good damage. But Fear of the Nine wins already used. And immuned out by Wrong Yu at that. So now you don't have to worry about the ult. You've got your Skiro no Shinto. Shoots it out. Gets some damage. Has to play safe. Twig makes sure the mid laner feels uncomfortable. Unsafe. Quig gets back to the base. The rest of the team still trying to fight. And that might be too much of a commit for Captain Twig. Killed off. Picked off. And now a 4v5 in favor of the Leviathans around the FG. And adapting, step into the tornado at very low HP, almost goes down there. Pyromancer is dropped, even with that ultimate down and with Twig off the map. The Leviathans can't step forward. They can't go in for the Fire Giant. They've got plenty of vision in the pit, but the health bars were too low. Wrong, you can heal up one person at a time, but it just it's quicker to go back to base, heal up. By the time they get here, Gore, Big Man Ting's ultimate's going to be up again. He's got both relics. There's no CC towards him. This Cuckoo is still going to be a big threat towards the pit. But is T Twig going to be up is maybe the bigger question. Still 17 seconds. He'll have ult when he's back. Blink, beads, all of that. 
But he's going to need a little bit more. Kings have to set up for a defense here. I don't know that they truly can. Watching Kings it's gives done. it away more than anything, and they are stepping back. Fire Giant goes over to the Levi's. Still a minute short of enhanced, but they get it on all five, and they've got the power play. Yeah, I'm guessing that was the, the call. The Camelot Kings were nearby. They didn't commit. They didn't step up onto those wards. They said, hey, we'll sit here in case they get Fire Giant very low and try to hold it 30 minutes, but we're not going to walk up and forfeit our lives at this point. The Naja is just not going to be able to make it in. Captain Twig just now spawning in. No reason to overextend if it's not an enhanced Fire Giant. But now the Leviathans get to push up. Last Tier 2 tower on the map. And actually, there's some Camelot Kings over in the jungle. I was what? Oh my Shido god! Shido just deletes him? There's no time to react. There's no time to say anything. No time for teens to even think. He had Angus, relics? They're all up. He had no deaths. And Shinto changes that with the press of one button. Deletes him. Now, all of a sudden, you're in a spot. If you're the Kings, you have to defend. You have to defend here. Adapting's going for mid Phoenix. The rest of the team of the Leviathans looking for right. Quig's lurking in the waters. Trelly, there's too much to defend, and they're too spread thin. Mid Phoenix goes down to Adapting. We got to watch. He's going up into the air. Variety with a crack and looking for the defense. Twig goes in, but Twig can't do anything. Adapting dives deep into the back, and he's looking for a little bit more. They're looking for the end, and they're looking to put themselves on set point. As they march forward. Two Phoenix is gone. Three kings to defend. But these three kings just don't seem to have what they need. Damage is good, but now they've got tings. Comes in, ult, gets some damage, spreads them out. Forces Leviathans to fall back. They've got single target healing. You had mentioned that earlier, but it's not going to be enough to keep them here, wrong you? Focused on Panda Cat adapting in the jungle. So they can let out a breath. So they hold on just a little longer. Yeah, smart call to back up here, but it doesn't seem like the Leviathans are truly backing up. Looks like Final K wants to try and taunt some back in, but it won't happen. Tycho Drums gets no value. Leviathans back up for now. Twig's still gone for 11 seconds, but he'll be back in time to defend a left side Phoenix of the Leviathans, decide to back up, grab themselves a Primal Fury, and give up on their Siege. Man, I mean, just deleting Big Man Tings off the map before the Siege even <laughs> begins. Yeah, I gotta see it. He gets to watch. I mean, it's not like this was a shock. I think it's the 180 flick. Maybe that surprised him, or maybe it was the 100 to zero. I'm not too sure. But yeah, I saw Variety's face down. He's like, wait, are you dead? Like, <laughs> He's like, did you just die to that? <laughs> I'm st honestly, I'm a little. I think I'm more floored watching it because it's just he's. There's a cuckoo, full health bar. He's just fine. Everything's going okay. Twenty one hundred. Yeah. No, I see it. And then suddenly, no more. <laughs> he's just gone. <laughs> oh man, sixteen kills for the Leviathans. Fire Giant still up for a minute. Probably not going to be finding too much, but they got, they got two phoenixes. I don't think they need too much more. We're talking second round of beacons. If they want to go for that, Pyromancer spawns in. Otherwise, maybe a dance for the EFG. Quick. You want to you hear something spooky? Sure. Shito has a 3K pot. His ult can do more. <laughs> oh <my laughs> what God. you just saw to, done to Tings, he can do more. And he will show you here shortly, possibly. Yeah, taunt in from Variety. Charge up. I'm watching Shito yeah. now. <laughs> Keep like your eyes on man. And we got to listen for that audio cue. Anytime he's charging up, you know the Kings are listening for the same thing. Speaking of which, they got to pay attention to the map. Dual lane for the Leviathans. Pushed up heavy on left. Rat goes in. Rat stops the back. Pulls the Kraken. Manages to keep two over here. Adapting just has to stay alive. Keeps his team. More importantly, keeps the Kings distracted. His team's safe. As they try to get aggressive, look for the last Phoenix. Couple shots from Panda Cat. Take the bird down to one third HP. You're going to have Shinto coming over here. He's popped that 3K pot. You got to be careful while he has that ult. That's what the Kings are going to aim for. Phoenix is oh. the target. Ult does not connect from Shinto despite the shot. That's going to allow them enough space, though, to take down the Phoenix. Twig goes up in the air, comes down, waiting. Arms deleted is wrong, you, and a great combo. And they're looking to crack down one more of the Levi's. Two kills for the Kings, but it costs them a lot. They've, they've got one singular play here. The Kings need to go for Fire Giant. I mean, their Titan is so weak. They need to send someone back to defend. But at that point, you got to get EFG and then go back to defend. 
I'm guessing Adapting might want to go in for a 1v1 here. You've got Variety. He's going to be the one to walk up. How much damage does Adapting have? Is it enough to get a one-shot? Let's find out. Doesn't need a one-shot, because guess what? Panicat's here as well. <laughs> Has some help. But are they going to find tings. it? They don't even have the kill just yet. Variety. The chase is not going to be on Ting. Seems to be the easy target. Still has both relics. Twigs and Yark just do fire. So maybe you have enough. Yeah. And they're going to start it up, Twig. Hardcore. Going to do exactly what they need. Look, this is maybe the best performance that an 08 and 5 Naja has ever put on. Fire Giant enhanced. And on the Kings, all five get it on their belt. They get the lives of two of their Phoenixes back. They stop fire minions, at least in mid. They're going to need to stop them in right. But Trelly, they have stabilized. And admittedly, all off the back of a respawn ult from Tings to really separate the Leviathans from their Titan just a few minutes ago. Yeah, and I think the difference is the Leviathans could have played that better. They have three Phoenixes down. They have a weak Titan. But they played so defense. I guess they recognized, hey, one pick might mean the end of our game, which might be a stretch. There's still three tier two towers up. But I think instead of going with the kill on a variety, they can push up mid. They can look for a phoenix. They can try and draw some of the Camelot Kings back. Because I feel like there's no reason with your Titan that weak and the phoenix is that low that you can send four to Fire Giant and not have to worry about either A, is Shinto charging ult somewhere, or B, are we getting backdoored, right? None of those thoughts were in the Camelot King's head. They had nothing to worry about. The Leviathan showed themselves. They said, hey, we're not defending Fire Giant, but we're also not really fighting you. We just have to play safe because we overcommitted. Now you're up against an enhanced Fire Giant, which, if we're honest, score the Camelot Kings, I don't think they're going to use. Yeah, well, they're, they're using it. They're just using it to defend as best they can. Yeah, Fire they're going to be right there. As much as they can. They were holding on for Phoenixes. They've got mid, uh, about as healed as it's going to get. They're trying to get their right side Phoenix into that same spot, and left side is going to be a worry. Now you've got a Fury. Going over towards the Leviathans, they still got the gold lead, but we're at the point where we're talking late game full builds. Upgraded relics are really the only thing that's missing for a few of these players, and of course, you know, power potions whenever they come through. So, the big question is going to be, what is the goal? And really, I guess that's the question to you. What is the goal? What's the next few minutes look like? It seems like it's just going to be King's defense. Yeah, for the Kings, it is to not walk past their red buff. That I mean, even the red buff is a bit sketchy because right now oh, Twigs by variety. himself. Yeah, if you if you walk <laughs> up a little bit too far, your game's over. Because remember that Titan is still weak. There is still an opening, and oh, Twig gets caught out. Has to ult. Doesn't seem like Final K is able to grab anything. But it is not to clear tier two towers. It's not to push out waves. It is to sit there and just stall. That is the Camelot King's game plan. My guess is the Leviathans knew it was going to come to this. That's why they didn't contest EFG. They recognized, hey. The base is too broken. The Camelot Kings can't form an offense. We're okay with giving up one EFG. We're still going to be ahead. We're still going to have the lead in the fights. We just have to play this one safe. Variety's here, though. Does have a crack and a try and defend. Remember, Captain Twig's ult was used defensively. But he will have his blink and his ult back up shortly. And that's why the Leviathans are going to have to back up. Still some fire waves over and left. That the Camelot Kings have to deal with. I mean, they don't want to chase too far. Yeah, they... Oh, Jelly, for, for, you know, just calling a spade a spade, they prolonged the game. Yeah. And that's what they needed to do. <laughs> they were going to lose otherwise. They needed to plant their heels in, and that's exactly what they've done. They haven't gotten risky with this fire giant. They haven't done anything insane. In fact, the most the riskiest thing they did was what that they just experienced on right lane, stepping up to the Leviathans at all. And most of that was just trying to get out of there. So now, again, with more than double the kills for the Leviathans, 5,000 gold, but... As we march inevitably towards that 40-minute mark, it does not make that big of a difference. Feels like we're looking at the next Fire Giant fight as the, the big game changer. Although maybe it's going to be around this beacon. You've got five kings. you got four Levi's. And they're going to go in. Let's listen in to the kings as they try to take this fight. Careful, bud. Don't you that all anything. I'm ulting. Oh. Oh. We go fire, we go fire. Rushing dash in, rushing dash in. We go fire, this is good, this is good. You got one shot in the back. Okay, chill, chill, chill. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm fine. Why? If someone didn't get one shot, we actually win there. Well, that's usually true in most fights. If you don't get one shot, you might win there. Unfortunately, all falls apart. Now the Leviathans, Trelly, they've got a numbers advantage. 4v2. 
But that two is a very mighty two. Tings is going to make it back to the fountain. Adapting on right. The other three. Sans fine, okay, in mid. Fire it's all on Tings come here. Up. They're going to be going for it. And yeah, it's looking for the game end. Approaching 39 minutes. Leviathan's march in. The damage is there. Tornado drops down. Good damage. Good DPS. But you need a little bit more. Your ult is not back up yet if you're Tings and you just don't quite have it. And the Leviathans are going to do exactly what they need, when they need, to put themselves up 2-0. I mean, that's the thing. The Camelot Kings are feeling confident. They had EFG, but the EFG falls off. Captain Twig goes in. Sure, connects the ultimate, but you got to remember Undying Love exists. Beads exist. If you don't bring someone up, you're probably not getting the kill afterwards. Doesn't set up anything for Big Man Ting, and then the Kings have to go on full-on retreat duty, and the Leviathans get the easiest end ever. They don't have to do a dance around EFG. They don't have to contest with Spirit of the Nine wins for confirmation. They just get to win a fight in mid and walk forward. Yeah, and around a beacon. Yeah. Beacon 38 minutes in, right? Like It's one of those things where I'm mentally gearing for us to, okay, how do, how do we get to this next EFG? Because yeah. that's when the next action is going to happen. I yep. uh, was not expecting to see them step up, hold, and then even fight around the beacon. And unfortunately for them, all it takes is, I mean, we saw Shinto do it. You find one good ult on the Thoth, especially that late in the game, yep. uh, you're deleting somebody. We saw it a couple times. It was fun to watch. But the Kings are going to have to do a lot of work if they want to turn this one around. They're down 0-2. We'll find out what they have to offer us right after this. Enough of the code switching, been hitting my soul, been on the ropes, I'm ready to grow, so get to know me. Keep your head up, I want you to grow with me. See this gold on me, want you to glow with me. Yeah, alright, okay, okay, we get it. No contest. Wait, see this gold on me, so want you to glow with me. The world been dying, days is number, check the climate, I'm sick of it. They had brain scheme to get the riches quick. I played a long game with Serene scene and I whipped this quick. From the back room to the hearts, I'm in the thick of it. I grind too hard for y'all not to see me a star, bitch. I'm raising a bar like they really pay me to talk my life in a shambles. But I got handles, I'm finishing at the rim. I remind you time and again and again that I'm really him. Oh, you ain't up. This not just for the show, but that you entertain. Anybody not for me is below me. Blow me, you in the way. I live my dreams, I got it locked, the master keeping on me. Back in the field, running audibles with the team. Everything I got out the mud and told my truth. I shake that fake shit. They praise you, then minimize you behind you. Just know I notice you. Stay woke, no joke. It really be the ones you closest to. Had to stop sleeping on myself like I ain't know the truth. Oh, this to me like it's really nobody code is this. And if you disagree, then you jaws and your claim get audited. Who you know do the beat and the talking and write the harmonies. I'm really convinced there's nobody out here going hard as me. Wish well the dog that claimed belief in me so he could use me. Look at me now, you chose your route, I know you sick to see it. You talk a lot, all that flop, but that's not harming us. Capping your status, we back, ain't nobody raw as us. To the ones that held me down for the count, look at what growth will do. I'm the kid from the code that's filling double sex with loot, they pay to play my sh back. Ain't no way I'm going back until I'm fossil fuel to the flame, just like I'm supposed to do. Enough of the code switching, been hitting my soul, been on the ropes, I'm ready to grow, so get to know me. Keep your head up, I want you to grow with me. See this gold on me, want you to glow with me. Been hitting my soul, been on the ropes, I'm ready to grow, so get to know me. Keep your head up, I want you to grow with me. See this gold on me. I've been on a job, trying to take it far. I need that ROI, that didn't pay the cost. I'm all in on me. Little baby, she agrees she really been here through the fall. She the only thing I need. I want to be free. I know that they want me for my ideas so they can line their pockets. Don't hit me to tell me that you give a f about me. You don't even know nothing about me. Trying to force me on your timeline. You know you need to stop it. I live for more than attention. Might not be your trending topic. Put my worth in analytics. I admit that took a toll. I got addicted to scrolling. We know well that that get toxic. I got caught comparing me to people I don't even know. They say it's lonely at the top, well maybe then I'll focus on things that's more important And let whoever think whatever and just keep it moving These niggas won't work on themselves, they'd rather see you losing You'll never see me losing Enough of the code switching, been hitting my soul, been on the road So ready to grow, so get to know me Keep your head up, I want you to grow with me See this glow on me Got 
to get the cake Okay, this ain't what you used to Always with the new rule, this ain't what you used to I do me, do you I do me, do you This ain't what you used to 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 This ain't what you No, this ain't what you used to Switching from the bikes to a new coupe You know I keep some new shoes Keep it simple, not like you All night, get right Know you know the price Know you know the name, no games I need all my money now I'm not playing, man, yeah, this ain't what you used to I might fly to LA This cold weather ain't for me Hit the bank, round your way What you used to? And I'm grinding to the top I can't let it slip away So I gotta get the pay Okay, this ain't what you used to Always with the new rule This ain't what you used to I do me, do you I do me, do you This ain't what you used to 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 This ain't what you Cause keep coming in for the win, get it in. This ain't what you used to. So you get on my nerves, try in my line, get curved. This ain't what you used to. Round round swerves, everybody here knows the word. This ain't what you used to. Know you know the drill. Over there now, I see the rail. This ain't what you used to. I get it in for my kids, stack those chips and I get. <laughs> And a back and forth game number two. It's the Atlantis Leviathans who come out on top and take the lead 2-0 in our best of five set. Uh, Mifflin, this one was a whole lot of team fighting back and forth between these two teams. At some points, the Camelot Kings are coming out on top. They're finding their combos with Quig, or I'm sorry, with Captain Twig and BMT, able to get these Naja Kokolkins. But as we start getting to the late game, as we start hitting kind of the sieging stage, we start to see some of the difficulties of maybe relying on some of these combos for the Camelot Kings. Yeah, couldn't quite line it up when there's someone in the back line, Shinto, just sending out artillery strikes from downtown, right? How, how many times did we see Shinto just eviscerate one guy? Too Big many. Man Tings, I believe, got just 100 to 0 twice that game. Just got clipped by an ultimate. Oops, I guess. Un unlucky. A little bit easier for Thought to line those up than it is for Kokolkin on the other side, but. Top to bottom, I think a good strategy there from the Leviathans. You're right to say that it's back and forth, but that back and forth, I think, more so lies at the feet of the Leviathans being unable to secure contested objectives. So far this set, every Fire Giant that was truly contested, I think maybe once, has been confirmed by the Leviathans. Otherwise, either stolen away or has to drop because the team fight starts to go a bit south or, or this, that, or the other extenuating circumstances cost them the objective but as long as it's just team fighting and pvp atlantis leviathan's looking real good for all their efforts we did get to see a little bit of that early game presence from the leviathans namely adapting setting pace on rat but wasn't quite enough for them to push their lead to an insurmountable amount uh, that came a little bit later on as they scaled with the composition and i think that scaling you can look no further than shinto to see exactly where that had come from that both just absolutely dominant 8-2-8 eight, eight performance from Shinto out of mid. What are you going to do about it? I mean, so many of these clips is just, who's walking in first for the Camelot Kings? Quig tries to take some space, loses 50%. Variety does the same, loses 50%. And things just happen so, so fast immediately afterward. And I'm looking at the composition from the Camelot Kings. There is not a clear diver to deal... Oh, my God. There is not a clear diver to deal with, with, uh, with Shinto on the other side. I mean, you could say, well, Twig could do it. Twig's Naja. Sash is your best gap close if you don't want to just throw the ultimate out from downtown. And here's the thing. You got to get LOS, and Shinto doesn't. He can shoot through walls. So very difficult for Twig to deal with it. Quig, straight line, can't go through walls. Super hard for him, too. I think that's where Warriors start to come in play, right? And I know that Warriors are in a bit of a poor state right now, but picks like Thoth might just force you into that role because no one else is allowed to step up to him. I think this was one of the one shots that we were talking about. Dude, this one's gross. Just earlier. See ya. Just 
That was literally 100% of his HP. That's right. In the blink of an eye. I think it happened twice. I think it happened in that one. And then in the fight in mid lane, I think Yark may have gotten tagged by one as well. Just one of those cases where there's not much that you can do except press your Aegis button if you have it or sidestep the ultimate if the Aegis is down. Sometimes, though, you can't even see them coming in that case. You think, okay, maybe that's got, surely that's got to be out of range. There's no way he's going to be able to hit me with this. And then it does. You uh, think? Wait, you're telling me someone's out there saying no? That yeah, Tho so doesn't have he the doesn't range. Have the distance BM, for that. You're telling me BMT Jordan <laughs> Yolfiker is sitting across the booth saying, "Yeah, I'm, he's, he's not going to reach me. Look, no he's shot. All, he's look, like, there's a whole tier two tower gap between them at incorrect. that point. You might think that that's not enough distance, but it isn't in, in this case. Take a look though. At least for career player damage, Shinto has bumped himself up into 20th place. And, and you got to think. Shinto has been around the scene for a bit of time, I believe, playing e e all the way back in some of the other leagues that we had had before we made the, the full split to just EUNA and then the full split just here in in-house and coming in. And he stands up uh, at the top. The people right around him, Benji, Kubo, Fred, I, I think it it is a, a huge testament as to the aggressive nature of this player, how active Shinto likes to be on the map, even if he is a, a little bit of a farm gremlin half the time. It's so that when he can start getting to 25, 30 minutes, he can do exactly what we just saw in that last game, being able to one-tap everybody. Pretty realistic for him to hit 11 million career damage over the course of this next game. 30,000 for a mage? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm that's thinking easy. that's a, a pretty decent milestone for him. Might even be able to catch up to adapting, given a, a few more years. 285,000? Uh, okay. Maybe. Maybe by Worlds. It, Maybe at Worlds. It's possible, but... There would have to be a if lot he's of... he's averaging 40 per game, that's what? Like six, seven, eight more games? It's not yeah, bad. Yeah, and then the Dapping's also got to do like maybe five or 10,000 damage over the course of the game. Well, that's not happening in this. I mean, still 40,000 for Shinto this game. So I, I think very worth within the realm of possibility, unless the game ends in like 20 minutes next game and, and we don't end up going to a game number four. But I think 11 million would be a huge milestone now for Shinto over the course of his career, adapting three, one, and nine on the Ratatoskr. While not getting a ton of kills in the late game, the, those first four or five clips that we saw, every one of those kills afforded to the people in those lanes because adapting is making those rotations. Starts over in duo, immediately still hitting that level six, level seven, goes into mid, sets up for a kill, and then goes all the way to the duo lane and sets up a third kill. This is just the presence that adapting has on this map. And I do want to point out, a few of those team fights nearly do, do go the way of the Camelot Kings. I saw two distinct team fights on Fire Giant where Rongyu is either the most giga brain, big, big picture player on the planet, <laughs> just saw everything from the top down and lines up his ultimate perfectly. Because Big Man Tings was sending out phenomenal ultimates. His placement of Spirit of the Nine wins what was very good. I think reflected, of course, in his KD does go six and one. But I saw two or three where double immune happens and I'm thinking to myself, oh, if that just hits either of those people, that's a one team fight for the Camelot Kings. And all of a sudden, Fire Giant with the Kings a little bit cleaner. Maybe they're talking about their siege now. So that was a close game, even if it doesn't appear to be at some of those late game team fights. I'm actually looking at some of the milestones right now. We already mentioned how Shinto is only, you know, was it 29, 30,000 away from hitting his 11, 11 million mark. On the same team, Panda Cat. Now this one might be a, a little harder to achieve unless Panda Cat gets really active and the game might go a little bit longer. He's only, I believe, 45,000 away from hitting 15 million player damage. He's the number four in rank right now. Who's number one? Uh, let me hit it, switch to, let me hit the little button here that swaps their ranks around, hits their damage. Number one, Big Man Tings. He's BMT? Jordaniel BM Thieker? BMT, Barra, Vote, Panda Barracuda? Cat. Barracuda? Barracuda is how there. much? 15.1 mil. And what, what, what's your Daniel at? And he is at 15.3. Oh, man. Ain't nobody catching him now. And then votes right behind Barra by 20,000. Votes up there? Votes number three. What? And then it's Panda Cat Variety Cyclone. ADCs maybe busted a little bit? Or like, what are we thinking? I'm on it. I'm not surprised we don't have more solo laners up there considering how much like fake damage they accumulate over the course of games. Yeah, you but there's like real impact damage <laughs> that mages get to do or ADCs get to do a little bit later on. Yeah, Plus seasons one through four were just like ADC metas, I think. Yeah, no matter what anyone tells you. You heard it here. To okay. be fair, Cyclone's been also did play solo as well. Playing for a long time. Playing for a and long time. And played solo whenever he could play literally anything he wanted he to was over playing in that Kali lane. solo a lot, yeah. 
Kali, Alquan, Bakasura, Uller, Hanbat. Dad, he played a lot in solo lane thinking about it. One of my first weeks of ever playing competitively, it was back in the weekly tournaments that Hi-Rez used to host before there was a true league. It was invitationals only that you would accumulate by playing in the weeklies. I got pulled through wall by Cyclone Spin at like level five-ish, and, and it was into like four eggs set up. Oh, All the OG no. players in the chat are thinking to themselves, oh my God, what happened next? He jumped on my back and I couldn't do anything. There's 80 <laughs> eggs eating me. So you don't have to deal with that anymore. Enjoy that. Uh, this might balance a little different now. That's just not going to happen to you. If you're unfamiliar who he was talking about, that was old Arachne, by the way. Yeah, there right. are some people who might not even know that that was what Arachne did was have a pull. They think a pull, oh, that's like what, Sylvanas? He can pull through a wall? I was playing Loki to counter that matchup. I was stealthing and he was still hitting him. He's just that good. He's he, he's got your different. number dialed in, and that's why he's top five, and that's why he's up there. Actually, Cyclone's number six, and that <laughs> that's why he's top ten. <laughs> well, maybe you should have stuck to the Arachne Cyclone, huh? Play a little bit more. We have the picks and bands ready now for game number two or game number three. After we've gone on our fun tangent about old school smite and top player damage across the league, the Leviathans and the Camelot Kings for their third game. Bands, we will see Poseidon join the ranks this time for the bands, which is extremely surprising to me given that before this event, Poseidon was seeing some play, a little bit of solo here and there. I think we saw maybe one or two mid games, maybe one jungle, but it's only maybe like six to eight games over the course of the entire phase. Now he's being top three by almost every single team so far today. So it's maybe surprising seeing this high of, of a rising for Poseidon and so much so that it now warrants a ban here from the Leviathans. But it does make sense in the meta that has started to develop over in that solo lane. Having mobility as well as high confirmation potential for Totem or rotating in towards objectives and being a massive threat still with that Kraken, I think, does fit the meta right now. And when you think about the matchups that we're going to see Poseidon into most frequently, I'm thinking about that Raijin. How many times that game did we see Raijin's pre-fire on dash get caught by Whirlpool? It was a significant amount of time. So I I'm not so certain that it's... Poseidon is strong himself, so much as he is strong into what is strong, right? Uh, in a vacuum, Poseidon much weaker than maybe some of these other mage solos that are that are getting locked in, like the Aqua Ashura or um, the Raijin himself. Camelot Kings, considering their third ban overall, maybe. Is it crazy to ask for a third ban here? Is that a bit wild? Maybe it is, with Chernobog still on the table. It might be, but after a game like that, Maybe not so much, just knowing what he's capable of. But at the same time, you also have to think about the flexibility of a god like Raijin as well. Could go over to Shinto's hands, could go to the soul laner, fine, okay. Won't see either of what we were maybe calling for. Instead, it's an Aphrodite ban by the Camelot Kings for the first time this event left open. Right. Be a first pick Chernobog for Leviathans. Right. And a whole lot of threat on map. Options for Panda Cat or Shinto to go towards this pick. But in response, maybe we can weigh some of the the, the the cons and the pros uh, of this trade-off. You give up Chernabog on the Leviathans, but now you give over Raijin and Maman Brigitte to the Camelot Kings. I am, I am still on the fence at the relative strength of Maman Brigitte. She is obviously incredibly powerful and has maybe one of the highest 1v1 potentials in Smite right now. But we have got an entire year of Chernabog supremacy to lean back on that global presence is ridiculous. In a meta where junglers are hovering duo lane more often than not, his ability to get involved in the soul lane is what makes him uniquely powerful on this Chernabog. That global presence is so difficult to deal with and landing Morgan with one fame. of the best stims that hunters have got in Smite, of course, makes him even stronger. A little bit more global presence for the Lance Leviathan. So the rat lock in. Don't need to talk about what a rat does. I think adapting made a good argument for it himself already this set. And then Morgan Le Fay third overall decent self peel will be able to if you're catching maman brigitte at opportune times to peel with that dragon flight or even the sigil mastery but because maman brigitte applies her damage so quickly and it's a dot and it's a dot that's incredibly difficult to lock down when the burst is coming uh to this day i, I feel like every time i read discourse about maman brigitte maybe reddit or twitter they don't really understand that it's the the passive oh, yeah. that's killing her but it's it's super hard to track that which means that it's really hard to know when to use your abilities, when to use your immunities, things along those lines. So Aegis, I think, almost intrinsically nerfed up against Milan Brigitte just because of how her damage is applied. Makes it really, really difficult, I think, for Morgan Le Fay as well to know when she's allowed to peel for herself or when she needs to be concerned 
How about going for her defensive relic? So we'll see how that matchup develops as the Ool is locked in for the Camelot Kings. A little bit of pressure early on, but I, I would argue Ool not exactly strong until three items into the build. Six slotted with Bluestone, one of the most oppressive hunters, just get hit by Hail of Arrows over the wall and all of a sudden 30% of HP is gone. It's one of the worst feelings ever. So potential there, but looking at the King's draft now, I'm not seeing a lane that you're going to play through consistently just yet. Raijin over in the soul lane is in the soul lane, even though he's strong. You probably don't want to spend too much time there. Is Maman going mid? If yes, your mid laner is going to be weak because she struggles in the in, in just about every single boxing matchup. And Morgan Le Fay's got plenty of boxing potential if it is Morgan Le Fay mid. If it's in the jungle, Maman, pretty decent ganks, but still takes a little while. I would say two items is when she starts to feel like a, an actual threat on map. So early game could be a struggle here for the Kings. We'll have to maybe wait and see if this ends up being the Maman mid, or if maybe it's Uller mid, throw the Maman over into the jungle as a potential for the Camelot Kings, or if we're even right on the Raijin, if that's solo or is that mid. Where's everything going at that point? Maybe the more of that to be answered as the draft continues to roll through. Ares and Thoth banned away by the Kings. Leviathans will take away Odin and Ganesh from their ranks. So I wonder where the rest of the Leviathans composition comes. Go towards supports. Some of the big ones like Kepri is still available. Charon notably also still up, as that's one that at least wrong you has been going towards a lot more frequently. I remember it was the Leviathan's Ravens match that Charon actually became the, the target of both of the supports huh? for a while. Okay, no, and yeah, now at the fine. hell, gotta imagine Quig gonna be taking this one as he has been playing that one. What? Quig's been playing this one a little bit. I wouldn't be surprised that this one went to BMT, but at least for me, I could see Quig maybe taking this one. Has he played it competitively? Have I been blanking? I'm, I'm blanking so hard. I'm pretty hard sure on he that. has, unless I'm like gaslighting no, you're right. myself. No, you're right. He played it up against the Oni Warriors uh, about 12 days ago now. He's got eight games on it, technically. That probably also includes some of Phase 1 when it was like Hell, Afro, Nox is the three. Do you want Hell? What, what, what attracts the Hell pick here? I mean, Cleanse for Telegraph CC. So Baron Somdi in particular, I think, would be a, a strange pickup considering it's single target CC from that ultimate that should be easily cleansed for the most part by hell. In a rat, you could prevent the chain CC so long as you're not the one getting knocked up by the ultimate. Sustain, of course, very strong. So if these games are going to go long and they've tended to go long so far this set, maybe battles of attrition start to lean a little bit more so towards the Kings, but it is an easy target for rat to jump on early on. Or if you catch hell rotating through the jungle at any point, Chernabog can jump on her, and it's, it's just the additional movement speed that she gets from her heal that's going to be acting as self-peel there. Okay. That hell pick, is it, it really has thrown me for a loop. It, it, it is a very interesting power curve for the composition on the Camelot Kings in that mid-game, we're going to see a massive jump in their viability, but early game is going to be massively difficult unless we see some sort of amazing bridge pick in this fifth slot. And not, I'm not confident saying where any of these picks are going. I am now confident saying that that hell is going to Quig. Good eyes, J Mac. That's not a bridge pick. I mean, the Camelot Kings got to hunker down, tighten up their guard, and withstand the storm for like 10 minutes, I think. And that's not even to say that the Leviathans have an overly oppressive early game draft. It's just that they have a draft that is capable of playing in the early, whereas I don't really see that now for the Camelot Kings. So I'm going to take a, uh, a shot in the dark stab at these two compositions as to where they might be rolling. Chernabog, Baron Somni, duo lane for the Leviathans. Morgan Le Fay solo, put the Marty Cross in mid with the Rat and Jungle for them. I know I did things a little out of order there, but just kind of jumping back and forth. And then the Kings, I'm thinking it's going to be Neath mid with the Uller over for Yarkor, put the Maman in the jungle, Raijin solo, and then the Hell support for that squad. So going off of at least that kind of a, of a guess. Uh, again, we're lacking a bit of that true tank from these ones. Again, no Guardian, no Warrior in sight for these two compositions. How does this one kind of play out through the through the stages of the game? You know, when we start getting down to if we inevitably do hit that 30, 35 minute mark, which of these two teams has that advantage towards that late stage team fight and especially towards the sieging stage? Well, on siege, you're probably favoring, man. Counter siege, I am fully with the Atlantis Leviathans, I feel like their base defense is much better. 
As far as actual siege, when I look at siege, I almost entirely evaluate initiation. I know you could say, well, oh, double hunter composition is just going to burn a structure. Yeah, good luck getting in towards it if you don't have someone that can start your fight. And looking at both of these drafts, it's just zero initiation on the Camelot Kings barring Tycho drums. Uh, and then there's like maybe a little bit from the rat and then maybe a bit from the Baron Somdi too. I think both of these teams are going to struggle a whole lot when it comes down to actually knocking down the base. But 30 minutes in, how does a fight look? Camelot Kings praying that this Maman Brigitte, who is going to be playing solo agent in the jungle, finds one guy straggling, Meep has ultimate, make it happen fast, and then play the team fight 5v4, I think is the win con for the Camelot Kings. And Lance Leviathans is global, global gods. Let's catch anybody anywhere on the map, and we're both just going to jump on them as Rat and Chernabog. So I think similar ideas with very different execution from both these teams. Yeah, it's kind of that. We find one guy by themselves, dogpile onto them, you know, as you said, Neath Ultimate combined with Maman, whoever else may be around, or go for the stray Ratatosk or Chernabog, turn a fight from a 1v1 into a 2v1 or a 3v1 in that case. So, we'll have to really see as the game progresses how these two teams decide to play these compositions. So I think you're right to say this is no tank, tough initiation, Almost feels like we're going to be watching maybe a bit of an arena match between these two maybe. teams. So we'll have to see what happens in game number three as we throw it down to our casters, Gormizer and Trelly. Thanks so much, J-Mac and Mifflin. That's right. Game three, Levi's Kings. And of course, I've got Trelly alongside me with Doug giving us the views. And Trelly, <laughs> we are going into a very interesting dynamic. I guess reverting back to an interesting dynamic with these two teams. As we go back to a very squishy composition on both sides. No Guardians or Warriors in sight back like Game 1. And 74%, so now it swings even heavier in favor of the Leviathans. Yeah, they've got the double AD, well, let's go quad ADCs as far as I'm concerned. you got four Hunters throughout both squads in that regard. It's going to be interesting. I think that... You know, the Leviathan should have that early pressure. I think Mifflin was right to highlight that. But it's not as if the Camelot Kings can't find aggression. They've got, you know, two Bluestone Hunters that are going to come out of the gate with some CC at level 2. They've got the ability to try and look towards duo lane if that's a possibility. I mean, any time your team is going to get some good solid clear, which I think that's pretty much all Marty provides, right? A lot of good early ability damage. So they should be able to look towards some pressure over in left, being adapting. He's got Blink. You know, it's not like Quig isn't just going to keep everyone nice and healed up. But you still have the ability to fight if you want yeah. to. Considering Shinto's on Chernabog, you're not really looking for much aggression in the early unless you find Captain Twig out. Remember, he doesn't have beats. He's got the Blink. And Maman has the ability to get aggressive herself. You just got to watch that positioning. Now, I'm going to watch carefully. I mean, just Pro League-wise... The first time we actually get to see Maman in the jungle, so it'll be nice. What kind of dynamic Twig is going to bring? Uh, maybe the kind of damage output is really what I'm, I'm curious about. Because we've seen some of these fights early on not work out too well. But that's been fighting in the wave while you can't clear and hoping for the best. So, definitely some wiggle room. But I agree, I mean, when you look at it, outside of Rat, I feel like most of the picks on the Leviathans wouldn't mind waiting until 15, 20 minutes before they really get to, like, impact the game. Shinto, of course, can change stuff with numbers. But, you know, Marty likes to hang out. Morgan Le Fay can, can fight, so maybe it's right side oriented, which is where the Leviathans like to play anyway. But Variety's on a safer pick. It just does feel like the Kings have put themselves in a stronger position, at least for the early game. It's Harkor. He's looking to showcase... His Ulu, I believe it was Shinto in game one who was finding all those axes. Panda Cat now is going to be under the ire of one of the better mechanical players in the league. He has to play it carefully. Moments like that are where it can change. A lot of poke changed out back and forth, though. This is going to be an interesting lane. Do you expect the, the squishy nature of these comps to, to lead us to a bloodbath again? Yeah, I mean, the fact that there are so many ADCs tells me that aggression is, you know, still going to be looked for, but not as... It's going to be a lot of poke. Yeah, it's not going to be as much all-in. Dapton goes in for the gank over towards Variety. You, you want to get your ADCs to late game, right? So you don't have to necessarily look for all this action. Last game, 
you know, the writing was on the wall. I was like, okay, we are going to be fighting as much as humanly possible this time around. I can see why just playing it safe until ultimates come through at the very least will be the correct call. But Shinto, above all else on Chernabog, likes to go in. You know, when level 5 comes around, Shinto's going to put a point in that ult and just look left, look right. Like, can I fly in anywhere and make something happen? The benefit of being a mid laner is you're probably hitting level 5 before anyone else on the map, and just having a Chernabog show up at your doorstep before you get access to your ultimate can be scary. In this case, it's actually Fine OK who takes over level 5 first, but Shinto, I'm sure, is very close at well. There's just no action happening at the moment, though. Maybe you look towards Variety if you force out that dash, and it looks like Fine OK is trying to. Variety's going to hold on to it, not let Shinto fly in and get a free kill. He's got beats to try and stay safe as well. And now, ultimate available. And so, despite Fine OK's best attempts, Variety avoids first blood this time. And honestly, maintains the beat, so presumably for the next few minutes is going to be just fine. You have to imagine right now, I see the farm game stepping up. Twig wants to d usually do that anyway. Uh, but adapting, more or less allowing it, not putting as much pressure onto lanes. And so maybe a lot of back and forth poke. We'll see maybe damage numbers go up, but kill count might not match it. It also means, Charlie, that we we have to put some more pressure, I think, onto what lanes can find not only more pressure in their own right, right? Who's going to be able to outpush who? Uh, but I also think in that case, you know, who's going to be able to swing over, you know, early towards these mid camps? Who's going to be able to pick up like maybe an early gold fear? Do either of these teams? Because maybe we'll hold that thought as adapting. Looks for a fight around said mid camps. Is able to get, I believe, one of those. Loses the other two. Gets Shinto's ult as well. Which maybe goes to, to the point, are either of these teams in a better position for pushing objectives, pushing lanes? Well, at this point, I don't think objectives are coming up into anyone's mind, right? Oh, Variety wow. needs to get some juke shoes going. It does dash away. No tick damage on him. Looks like he'll be just fine. And actually, Captain Twig might have a way to go in here. And you're going to have not only that, the ultimate plus the World Weaver from Tings. It all lines up and does exactly what you need for first blood. Over to the Kings and over to Variety, who turns around his life and figures it all out. Yeah, fine. Okay, needed to hit one of those shots. Just did not have the range. Twig doesn't have the blink. I was wondering if he was trying to find a kill here onto adapting, but just does not have it. Two level lead though because of how much time adapting spent over on that side of the map. You lose the beads off of Variety but getting that kill is huge. I mean Shinto uses the ultimate, Big Man Tings uses the ultimate, both mid laners try and get involved. But it's the kill that goes the way of Final K who has been having pretty good pressure over in that lane as Morgan Le Fay should. I mean, Raijin's great, but that CC interrupts just about every part of his kit, so Final K should be getting the better end of those trades. But it's the dive attempt, where it's a bit of an overcommit, and you gotta always be looking at Big Man Ting's as ultimate, especially if you're overcommit. It's the same with Shinto, right? We talk about it all the time with Chernabog. Are you gonna go in for a 2v2 when you know Chernabog can ult in? You gotta be thinking about the World Weaver as well. That threat, that's one of the things, you know, you go back in time. The Camelot Kings love locking that in for teams. Specifically, put it in mid. World Weevil tr travels a little faster. Gets over to the sides a little quicker, which is what Adapting's going to try doing. Still has no beads. And that's an aggression. Forces out the dash. Now you got the World Weaver coming in. And just as much setup it provides, Peel is there as well. The Kings don't have to worry about it. Shinto even uses his ult to get on the right. And that means the Kings have two less ultimates and two less players to worry about in some of these team fights. Yeah, I'm a little shocked. That should be 100 to 0 every single time. Adapting hits, knock up into stun. Final K gets the fear, but doesn't quite catch the dash with Dragonflight. Again, you can CC Raijin for a, a solid five seconds with that combo, but Final K wasn't close enough. He had to overcommit. And now it's the Morgan Le Fay who's under some trouble, and he should be going down here. All you need to do is connect the Tycho drums, and Captain Twig gets the credit for that one. The gank regank. Twig might not be there on the first opportunity to help Variety, but he always comes through after the gank fails. And now you see it not only, uh, as you had mentioned, the two-level lead in the jungle. Fine OK starting to fall behind. Would not be surprised if Variety takes over to Tin soon. And we're left watching Fine OK still at eight for a little while. So a little bit of pressure has turned into a 
pretty comfortable lead. 1,500-ish, 1,300. But pressure that then applies itself over to maybe the left side of the map. You've got healing, you've got Ool, you've got Maman hitting level 9 and getting that Doom Orb complete. And now looking for a little bit more on to Shinto. Gets aggressive. Half health, the Chernabog. And Twig doesn't have to think twice about anything else. Falls back and is set up. Now, a lot of this conversation around Maman has been item-based. Right. Time-based. Doom Orb, a level and a half lead, let's call it. How much can Twig get done right now? Especially if, <laughs> geez, if Variety is playing like that. Alongside Tings, goes for the ult. Now adapting up, down, onto the solo laner. Don't know what he was expecting and who he was waiting for, but they weren't there. Now Tings leading the way. Shinto up into the air. Is he going to help wrong you or are they going to fall back? They've got Fine OK coming in. He's holding on as long as he can. Shinto lands low health into the wall. Keeps him alive a little longer. Tings is the target. Tings goes down. The Leviathans answer two kills in kind. And they bring themselves back on the board. Yeah, adapting. Gets so low there, but it's able to go up into the sky. Variety dashes in, but it didn't seem like he had the cooldowns. So once he dashes in, adapting goes, oh, I'm going to just up down at this point. Up down the explosion of souls. Captain Twig still trying to chase this one. Who's he going to dash to, though? Has to pick a good target. I don't know if adapting was the call. Yeah, you cannot finish that one. So Captain Twig can't keep chasing. The blink is also not available. Adapting should just pull this under tower. See if the steal comes through. It does it. And if anything, Final K stepping forward. Yeah, manages to get the dragon flight. If it weren't for Variety's presence, and I'll throw it out there, adapting's literal one hit away from death. Yep. <laughs> then maybe you actually see a turnaround and Twig pays for his insolence. Instead, Twig gets to invade, takes away the red buff, still has a small lead. But suddenly, Trelly, we have a much more interesting game. It felt like uh, we were seeing the Kings just kind of march themselves forward. Leviathans fight back and, and show that they're not just waiting for the late game. If that's the case, you got to watch out for how much this rat's able to accomplish. So far, all the kills Leviathans have on adapting, whereas on the right side of the map, a lot of damage heading towards Final K. Variety got to try and hit the Tycho drums. The beads should be enough, and wow. it is. That was close. Variety really needed one or two more shots of the Tycho drums, but could not close the gap. But Final K is sticking around. He hasn't left. A dangerous game. Will Variety dash in is the question. I want to see it. Well, now with the dragon so flight. I was going to say, with the dragon <laughs> flight down. It's not worth it, but I really wanted to see yeah. it. <laughs> Just go in, try to get the kill, yep. potentially lose your life. Yep. The thing that has caught my attention, first off, World Weaver getting ripped out every single time it's on cooldown. Oh, yeah. Perfect from Tings. That being said, in mid, he's lost his tier one. Yes. So that feels like a lot of the pressure the Neath could have. Like, you're now suddenly... Not as safe throwing out those World Weavers as aggressively as you were. You have to go back a little further to do it. Is that pressure that's going to be, uh, I guess, leveraged for the Leviathans? Or does he not really have to worry about it? it? It's exploitable for sure. Big Man Tanks only has backflip to try and get away. And if he uses that and there's no tower to hide under, you've got an opportunity to get aggressive. Fine, okay. He doesn't realize he's in trouble. Captain Twig and World Weaver coming in. But it's Variety who's taking a lot of damage. One more shot will do it, but Fine, okay. Can't find it. Here comes Shito. And they're looking at Twig. Should be just a few more shots. Finds it. Variety stays around. Fine, okay. Not going to be able to close gap. Had to run around the wall the old-fashioned way. So Variety will stay alive, but Twig pays for it. And now pressure on the, the Tier 1 tower. And right with Shinto over here, this should just be the tower, despite maybe some of the early lead for the Kings and the pressure going their way. It's now three kills and a kill, one single kill lead for the Leviathans. But on top of that, two towers they've been able to knock down. Yeah, Gold Fury is available, though. You see adapting on the left side of the map. You got three Leviathans around, but it doesn't seem like a fight is what they're looking for just yet. Shinto doesn't have that ultimate, can't get active on the left side of the map after just using it over on right. So that's going to be the end of the aggression for now. I still want to see an attempted pull towards that Gold Fury, but Beacon spawns in shortly, and maybe that's what's on the team's minds for now. You don't want to overcommit to a fight near Gold Fury, give up the Beacon, lose Gold Fury as well. Yeah, Panda Cat just finished Soul Eater. He wants to stack that item up as opposed to fighting. So, possible that we see a little bit of a slow burn here. There's the beacon. Three Camelot Kings show up first. Wrong, you can walk forward, but he does not have the backup of his team, especially with adapting over on the right side of the map. This beacon should be going down for free, and it is. So the Camelot Kings can grab that one. But this is about what I expected. 
grab the beacon, back up, right? You're not looking for fights, you're not looking for poke, you're not sticking around. It's just play this as slow as possible. Now, Gore, I wanted to bring this up because there is actually some application here. You know, with the Mons dash, it's okay. a very unique mechanic, right? Nox can dash into her teammates, but that means, you're, you know, you can jump out Unless your teammates take you on a wild ride, you're not getting too aggressive. Speaking of aggression, Variety taking a lot of damage. Yeah, use the Tycho drums. The fear helps out. Aegis buys some time, but it doesn't buy your life. That is a clean up from the Leviathans, but now you've got a response from the King. Shinto taking the poke, mainly from Twig. Returning just as much, but you've got a lot around the corner and no one's there to help you. Shinto goes down and trades out one for one. Yeah, I think you'll take that trade. I mean, Shinto's been doing so much farming, whereas Variety's level 12. He's run out of his tower. He is getting three-man dove, essentially, at his blue buff. That's a very big commitment just to get the Ryzen down, whereas Shinto, of course, is part of that commitment, right? He ults in. But killing that Chernobog is nice for the Camelot Kings. The only issue is that Final K gets to keep farming, whereas Variety is in base for dying pretty early on. You want to make sure that Variety is able to match that farm, because Final K has been ganked quite a bit this game as well. Remember, the Morgan Le Fay also has two deaths in the column. That Morgan Le Fay right now looking to buy some space, and does, around the Pyromancer. No ult for Final K. Wrong you in the neighborhood as well. Shinto's ult not back up yet. And that's going to be maybe the big key. That's kind of crucial to, I think, a lot of the fights for the Leviathans. A lot of fights for Chernobog. Numbers advantage. That's what he brings. Also thought, Trelly, when you went into to an actually excellent point about Maman, but we were watching Panda Cat when you started that. Uh, and I thought you were going to talk about that skin because it is truly terrifying. Oh, it is terrifying. And I, I will never forgive whoever does our UI for putting it on the front screen of Smite during Halloween. Yeah, and like right right when you load in, too. Yep, it wasn't the, like, oh, you have to wait a little bit. You get jump scared. And he's got like back arms. I call them barms. Not a big fan of the barms, I'll be honest. He's, he's invisible right now, but he's got arms on his back. And trust me, it doesn't. it's creepy. The, that and the half body on the tail. Um, and yeah, the dude in yeah, the tail. Ugh. Like there's just like a guy up there. <laughs> 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 He's so creepy, man. And it was on the front page for so long. Which being said, right now, I think there's a gym sale going on. So if you're watching, go ahead, jump in, get some gems, get some skins. Maybe you too can be terrifying and win purely off of Fright. Pyromancer, low. Variety's in the neighborhood. Has the ult, but not going to throw it out. And so Leviathans get the Pyromancer. Actually uses the Tycho drums towards the tail end. Looks for Wrong Yu, who ults in kind to get the CC immunity. So... Trading out there. Fine, okay, maybe in a bad spot. Goes for some knock-up. Gets some good damage onto Twig. And actually might need the follow-up from his team. Shinto comes in, lands down. You've got half health for Twig and Tings. Blink forward from Fine, okay. The aggression is there, and the knock-up is good from adapting. They're chasing him down. You need one more hit, but no, you manage to go one for one. The King's the damage heel. is nothing to laugh at. Quig right now is earning his paycheck with the heals and the cleanses, keeping the Kings moving. Wow, the Leviathan coming through as well. Wrong you. That heal definitely kept Final K as long as well. Sustain has been the name of the game for both of these squads. And you don't want to take a prolonged fight. Not against the Hell, not against Quig. So the Leviathans are going to back up there. Gold Fury still available, but no one really stepping forward. The Arcor hasn't quite got that fail not online. That's really when you see these Uller builds spike. Like, yeah, an Axe with some Hydra's procs hurt, but Axe with Hydra procs Crits, that's when you're really chunking. So Yarkor probably wants to go back to base. Finish that item up before a Gold Fury starts to be looked at. Doesn't quite have the gold to finish up a Fail Knot, though. He's about 300, 400 gold off. But Gold Fury, I mean, we're 16 minutes in, Gordon. There really hasn't been that much aggression towards it. Just been ward coverage, you know. The, the beacon got grabbed. Some Tier 1 towers. The Leviathans haven't felt confident to do so. I say the Leviathans because they do have the gold lead. It's not massive, but it's a gold lead nonetheless, and they haven't went in for any sort of pull. Instead, I mean, even seeing such a contest over the shield buff at this point, right? 16 minutes in. Admittedly, shield buff's pretty nice. Eh, it got but nerfed. A, but a heavy, heavy <laughs> contest. Adapting, taken down just above half, thanks to Tings. Maybe looking to go in, leaps forward, goes for the knockup, stuns on the twig, dart forward, but you get CC'd and you get eaten. It's jungle for jungle here on the left side of the map, and it doesn't seem like the duo lanes have the punch to back them up. So the kills keep moving forward, one for one. Charlie, it's still the Levi's with a small lead. 
Got Tings nearby, waiting to see if anyone steps forward. And there's three Camelot Kings that are ready to go in. I don't know if Ron <laughs> and Panic Cat knows this is happening. Death from above is available. Panic Cat's getting weak. Yeah, half health already. Has to play carefully, goes up to the sky, who's his target, seems to be thrown everywhere, but does not get a lot done in the process. Now you need a little bit more. You've got damage, but you don't have backup just yet. Fino Case and Shinto step in. They're going to come. Do they go ahead and dive the tower? They don't feel confident. And with Variety coming in, it's a King's fight one more time. World Weaver stuns out the mid laner of the Leviathans. They just need a little extra damage. Variety thrown as much as he can, but it seems like it's going to fizzle on out. A lot of poke. And unfortunately for Panda Cat, he ends up taking the short end of that trade. I mean, just so much sustain as well. You could tell Final K wanted to blink forward, wanted to Dragonfly, wanted to initiate any sort of engagement, but Quig made sure to keep the team nice and healthy. If you want to talk about anti-heal, I mean, yeah, Rong Yu's got Ankh, wasn't available. Adapting has Brawlers, he was dead. That's really the most impactful anti-heal, and it's just not there. So Quig has a field day. Once again, Shinto ults in, trying to take a 1v1 versus Twig, but he's got Blink through the Cosmos, not having the range adapting. He's going to have to let that one go as well. That's two ults from a Blink for Twig. I'm thinking the Camelot Kings are okay with that. I think they'd be very happy. We've got a beacon, at least potentially get a beacon over on left. Fire. It looks like it's going to go towards Kings. We've seen, look, I'm surprised. This is the first time we haven't seen a 12-minute Fire Giant pull. Instead, it's going to be a small bait. Fine, okay. Wanted Quig. Unable to find the lockdown. Use the blink. Simi down on, on a lot of the relics here for the Leviathans. They're going to pick up the Pyromancer, no problem. So they're playing around the map just fine. They get a Pyromancer, and again, that's a huge deal for them. Also, Charlie, to make you feel better. Okay. They have had more than one person buy the Baron's Brew this time. He didn't bring oh, nice. all those drinks just for no one. It was final, or it was Shinto only for quite some time. Final K did not start with it, which respectful, right? You want health pots early as a solo laner. But he did show up a little late. Sometimes you got to be tardy to the party, and that was fine, okay. Made sure that Rong Yu felt included with the Baron's Brew being purchased there. The Leviathan still, I mean, this game is so even, balancing essentially on a knight's edge. You can see the XP. Yeah, fine, okay, he's up two levels, but Captain Twig's up one. Okay, both mid laners are at 19, but Quig's got a lead. Yarkor, by the way, just hasn't left lane. He's got a two-level lead over Panda Cat, so it's just split farm throughout the entirety of this map, which means the team fights can be a little bit wonky. The biggest power spikes I'm seeing are, of course, Deathbringer being finished for Shinto. That's a ridiculous spike. The amount of crits that are going to come through and the damage of said crits are going to be ridiculous. But Shinto has been trying to fight, just, you know, fly in, find 1v1s whenever possible. Yarkor has been sitting around for a while. Yeah, I'm guessing Shinto knew someone was nearby. But it's been a lot of ulting on to, you know, solo lane, right? If it was Variety or if it was Captain Twig, someone split pushing on the right side of the map. Shinto gets to ult in, get the fail not proc, and try and win that 1v1. Now, he's over on the left side of the map, forcing people over, forcing the Camelot Kings to respect that either A, he's going to take this tower, or B, he's going to ult away the second you show up. It means the pressure's on. It's just, you know, where you're going to find it. I am keep anticipating <laughs> a grouping over on right. Something to benefit Shinto being alone on left. The Ghoul Fury is still hanging out over there, by the way. It hasn't necessarily had too much going on. A lot around it. Maybe we'll see something. I forgot too. to make my Maman point. You know, I oh. started very long ago. And it actually has a lot of, you know, benefit to the situation. Yeah. If Shinto split pushing left and you don't have any globals to send over there... You can send Twig, and he can say, okay, if Shinto ults in, I'm hopping in. I'm flying with you. We're not going to talk about that, though, because Fire Giants started up here with the Leviathans. Seems like it's more of a bait than anything, but the Camelot Kings are here. And also, it's Harcore who's going over to meet Shinto in left. So a true 4v4 on right. Well, let's not call it a true 4v4. Shinto could change that any time. But a carry v carry fight. And ex-teammates at that. Doesn't seem like either are hitting too much to make the big difference. Minion advantage maybe going over towards Shinto. Also, the adapting advantage is about to go over towards Shinto. He's coming over towards left. Harkor is the target. Knockups. Good beads too late. Aegis is going to buy some time. The tower gets some damage slow from Shinto and the ult. 
And then a couple more autos gets the job done. Now you gotta get out, Shinto. Lazy no back in, in the lane. And not too much you can do about it. Crits, a ring of true though. Oh my god, he's done a lot of damage. Aegis buys some time, but it's not gonna buy enough. Almost turns that one around on Twig. Back to Fire Giant though. Variety is here. Goes into the Tycho drums. I'm not sure that's the best play yet. Beats an Aegis. Is he able to make it out? No, Panda confirms that one, and Fire Giant has to be the call. Only Big Man Tings is close by. Quig is going to take a bit to show up, and the Leviathans don't want to continue their siege on the Fire Giant. They will just back up for now, and if anything, the Camelot Kings grab a free Tier 1. I mean, I love the call to take the 1v1. You got Adapting's backup, so of course you're going to be able to get that kill onto Yarkor. But thanks to Twig, thanks to Quig, you can't get Shinto back. To base, you get both relics and you trade out that kill. And Variety, I think he does what he has to do. When you know Fire Giant's happening and no one on your team's close by, you either hide around the corner, go for a low stake steal, or you show yourself immediately and try and kill. And that's exactly what he did. Doesn't get much, but gets the team off fire. Pyromancer is going to be the tentative answer, or at least started by the Leviathans. Questioned. And the Kings. Well, they're at least hanging out there. Now adapting up to the sky. You got a lot used by Tings, a lot used by Twig, and that's going to be the engage. Adapting dives in, knockups good. Harcore is the main target. Doesn't have relics, but is playing safe. Twig alone. Twig chase down, and it looks like maybe a collapse coming in from the Leviathans, but they aren't quite confident in their ability to chase down the Kings. Get a few to half, and instead fall back. Leviathans start up the Pyromancer. Kings step forward, try to steal it away. Unable to find it just yet. Surging forward. I mean, Trelly, it's five on five. It's death ball time. Both teams unwilling to leave the other alone for more than a few seconds. Twig? Oh, my God, the damage onto Twig as well in the tail end. Oh, just shy of getting the kill from Panda Cat. Showcases exactly the kind of pressure, and that means wrong you. You see, fine, okay, running them down, creating a little more space for the rest of the team. Yeah, fine, okay, still has Blink. Not too many ultimates available, but the Leviathans are feeling confident enough to step forward. Remember, I already said this. Quig can heal up just about anyone. If you walk forward, you think you're going to win a sustained fight. It's going to be sketchy, and Fire Giant's getting low. Fine, okay. Leading the way for his team. Variety is getting low. You need some damage, though. He goes to the Tycho Drum. Someone's got to shoot him over the wall. you got to fight. Instead, Variety free-firing right now. Adapting finally chases him down, kills him off, goes up into the sky, and is looking for the knockup. Hardcore Quig low in the back. That seems to be Adapting's target. And Shinto is coming in to back him up. They turn their eyes towards Tings. Force the backflip. Find some shots, but you need more damage. You need more CC. And it's just not going well for either of these squads. Low health abilities going a little wide juke shoes on and it's going to be two for one kings losing their right side of the map just panda cat in trade yeah, adapting was hiding just to see if yark would step forward knew there was no beads available is not going to find it yark is going to be healed up by quig but not step forward to chase doesn't seem like the smartest call wrong you already here towards fire giant and it looks like shinto going to send over to left to try and deal with the titan so there's not going to be any more pulls just yet but the Camelot King stuck by just to make sure. Shinto's got plenty of DPS, so he will be able to make short work of this Titan. Someone on the Kings has to head over, though, because a Titan left unchecked can take just about all these towers, especially if Shinto's doing the pushing as well. This is what I'm talking about. There's two different interactions with the Mons dash that I want to bring up because of Shinto's split push. There's the first one where, yes, Shinto wants to ult in, help his team. Captain Twig can hop in and fly with you. But the interesting thing about dashing into an enemy as opposed to a teammate is you can't choose when you want to dismount if they go up into the air. If, if it's adapting, for example, he can say, hey, instead of ulting in, I'm going to ult all the way back into my tower and bring you with me. And that could be a scary situation. We'll have to see if it happens here. Looks like it will. Uh, up into the sky, Shinto's going to bring him in, but bring them over to Variety and maybe creates an awkward scenario for him. Has to eat the World Weaver thanks to Gaga stays alive. And that wall is doing its work. He manages to survive. No way. And the team comes in. The team saves his life, adapting with a double Shinto as the perfect bait, the perfect setup, gives the Leviathans two. That is ridiculous. I really thought Shinto was just going to be flying into his death and bringing Captain Twig along for the ride. But this time, he delivers a free double kill to his team, helps out with the baits, and now it's just Big Man Tings to try and go near this fire giant with Final K rotating in. Yeah, you gotta give this one up. FG is gonna go the way of the Leviathans off of 
I mean, let's just face it, a great bait by Shinto. Could have been a kill. There was, he, he was very low. He was able to hide in the walls for quite some time. But when the Leviathans are able to collapse on him and help him out, ends up being a bait. And they're able to get Fire Giant on all five. I mean, it is exactly what you would want from him. I mean, you're talking alt used, beads used, Aegis used, the dash into the wall, and just praying that a stray shot doesn't find you. Good movement. I mean, he was just a few inches away. I feel like, you know, at least Chernobog probably had some hairs zapped off by Yeah, Raijin. for sure. And now he's got the Demon Blade. Already had the Deathbringer. Upgrades that with the Glyph. Feels like Power Sparks are getting hit here for the Leviathans. Now, Trelly all five with Fire Giant. They got three minutes and some change to get some work done. Pyromancer's up. Still one Runic Bomb in Rong Yu's pocket. Should be another one. Probably going to adapting if I had to guess. Or just give it over to Final K. He doesn't need wards. He's got a Chalice and a Runic Bomb. He's going to let the, leave the wards over to the squad. And there's still two Tier 2 towers to go through. We're 28 minutes into this game. Should be feeling confident if you're the Leviathans to keep the same plan going. Where Shinto split pushes. If he's in any sort of danger, ult away. Again, I thought that it would be a good play for Captain Twig. Because no matter what, it's going to be at least a 2v1 until the rest of the squad shows up. But even in a 2v1 situation, Shinto was not worried. His team shows up. So Captain Twig has to, you know, watch out for when he jumps in to hitch a ride. Because Shinto may be leading him into a bait. Now, Shinto just pushes right as the rest of the squad goes in mid. I, I don't like the call of dropping any runic bombs here. I think saving them for Phoenix is the, the correct play. You already have a pretty big lead, and these Tier 2 towers should drop naturally just by way of split push. It should be pretty easy. Panda Cat's alone on left. Shinto, V Twig. Something that, honestly, Shinto almost won earlier. About to have his relics back up. So maybe Twig has to play this carefully. Asked and answered. How's the, the the healing been, right? I mean, we, we talked a little bit about Quig earlier. And on defense, it feels like that's going to be necessary. But you, I see some, some anti-heal items online for the Leviathans. Is Quig going to be able to provide enough for this team on defense? I would say so. I mean, Quig has been on point. The, the, he's 1-0-5. The cleanses have been nice. The, the movement speed as well as the ridiculous sustain that this hell can provide. So even though anti-heal is a plenty, you know, considering the onks, the brawlers, things like that, and the Divine Ruin that Final K picked up. You know, I, as long as Quig's able to stay back with his team, sustain out of combat, and then, you know, rejoin the fight, should not be too much of an issue. Still one more Tier 2 tower to go. Adapting isn't the greatest threat to left Phoenix without a Runic Bomb in pocket, but is going to pull over Captain Twig for now. It looks like they might go for a little bit of a 1v1. I think Captain Twig wants to chase this. Well, adapting. Again, unique ultimate. That's going to be chased down by the World Weaver no matter what. Gets stunned out. Actually uses the beats. So a relic down for the jungler and the Leviathans. It's a very large split. Three on right, two on left. Twig trying to defend left. Already taken down too low. Has to fall back. Leviathans. Are they going to move to the more standard, you know, mid plus side lane as opposed to side lane and side lane? Uh, it turns out, Shelly, no, they're going to back off. Only got 20 seconds left on the Fire Giant. They're going to look at the reset, and we're going to be talking enhanced in a little over a minute. Yep, still had both Runic Bombs. I'm guessing the play was to kill Captain Twig there. They weren't able to find it, and because they didn't kill Captain Twig, the siege is just done. You know, they, they may be able to step forward, but I think... It's been a while since the introduction of Runic Bombs. Most teams are on point with being able to destroy those bombs before they actually get the, the damage off, right? You're not going to catch them off guard and just drop two bombs and destroy a Phoenix instantly. It's just not going to happen, not in this day and age. So I think the Camelot Kings were, you know, privy to that, and the Leviathans didn't go for it. But as you said, Enhanced Fire Giant is the play. Obviously, Shinto destroys this objective. I mean, he's got triple crit. It'll get you know, just shredded immediately if given any sort of alone time, which means the Camelot Kings need to be nearby as quickly as possible. As far as burst goes, you're probably looking towards still Shinto's auto attacks. I would assume that's the most, like, burst damage you're going to get. Maybe Yarkor, if he got his full combo off with a Hydra's crit, he could, you know, come close to that. But 
You got a 3k pot in tow, a red buff. Yeah, Shinto's probably the confirmation you're looking for. Maybe you use the runic bombs at this point, right? You've, you've got that freedom. So the Camelot Kings need to be here. And they are. Five strong around the Pyromancer as Variety's looking for poke. Wrong you and fine okay. Are a lot of the setup for this one. How they're going to engage is maybe just as important as how the kings are going to retaliate. Firemancer started up, it's going to get shredded. That is maybe a small taste of what the fire giant could be like. Wrong you. Forcing the ult and cancels it. Doesn't get anything for it. Just a little CC immunity. So maybe a big team fight ultimate, but it's only down for a minute, Trelly. It doesn't seem like it's going to be as punishing as maybe some of the others that the Levi's could have used. Well, if the Camelot Kings go in in the next 60 seconds, we'll see that punish. But Tings also sent out World Weaver. So they are going to step forward. Doesn't seem like a Fire Giant pull is in the cards, though. I see Variety dashing over to right lane. There's still a Tier 1 tower available for the Camelot Kings. All the yeah. while, Shinto decides to solo the Primal Fury. He's going to win that 1v1 handedly and might just head left. Given his positioning, yeah, it seems like he's going to go in, steal away a shield buff, steal away a purple. And unless someone backs to stop him... That's going to go uncontested for a bit. Shinto does have a Runic Bomb as well. So yeah, you leave this Chernobog alone with the Phoenix for like three seconds. That bird's gone. And worth mentioning, yeah, three Runic Bombs, by the way. That's a tactical nuke on one Phoenix, <laughs> if they so choose. And it's all up to the Leviathans. Right now, as you had mentioned, it's going to be play around the Fire Giant. You've got a 4v4. Ool is coming to match Shinto. So it's going to be a 1v1 on left. Fire Giant fight for the rest. Let's listen in on the Leviathans as they try to take this. Now, Trelly, I'm going to ask you an interesting question. They got three Runic Bombs and three dead kings for over 40 seconds. Do you agree EFG over Titan? I mean, you got to look at the health bars, Gore. I think that was the call. Panda Cat looked at his team and said, there's no way that we should be going in for the end call. Now they're looking a little bit healthier. I think the end call was certainly a possibility, but if Yarkor gets some lucky crits, gets some poke over the wall, it gets very dodgy. So I like the play to just go back. You still have... 20 seconds before Twig spawns, 32 before Variety, and you got Enhanced Fire Giant, so you don't have to worry about minions. Why not play it safe than sorry? You're up 3-0 at this point. No reason to go for the dodgy plays, and they're going to do just that. Right side bird, that goes down for free. All the while, adapting is just going to destroy mid lane by himself. Should be able to just go ahead and grab all of these. Yarkor stepped up very far there. If he gets hit by the Acorn Blast, almost certainly gets one shot. Has no beads or Aegis. But there will be a full-on retreat call. Two birds gone, just like that. And they keep all three bombs. Yeah, I mean, you didn't have to use them at that point, right? Adapting didn't have any to use to himself. But when you get 4v2 on a Phoenix with Enhanced Fire Giant, you might as well save them <laughs> for, the, for the, the, the last Phoenix over on left side. But that all starts systematically from Shinto split pushing, right? Yarkor goes to stop him. There's no fight. Shinto says, okay, I'm leaving. Good luck. I'm going to fly in and help my team. And then it's a 4v5. This is what that Chernobog provides. It is still so annoying to try and deal with. Twig tried to play once, and it ended up sort of working out. Again, if Shinto dies, it goes a little bit differently. But because you send Yark over there, you don't have your Uller to help near the EFG fight, and half the team just gets wiped. Leviathans are grouping up on left. No Fury, no Pyro. And they're skipping over the beacon for now. It's all eyes on the Phoenix. Two and a half minutes to play with on EFG, and again, three bombs in pocket. So they're going to step up, adapting, isolated right now in mid, kind of joining Shinto in the in-between jungle, and bouncing back and forth. They try to figure out where their engage is going to be, and more importantly, how strong that engage is going to be. This becomes one of the issues, Charlie, and, and we've seen this a few times with the Dragon's compositions. Maybe we'll see it here. Is who's going to tank it up? Fine, okay is the answer. And 
Jeez, that Phoenix gets shredded. Now, knock up good from adapting the dash forward. And now the kills are coming in exactly the way the Levi's would have wanted. Two gone on the right side of the map. It's Tings, Quig, and Hardcore to defend. It's the Leviathans marching themselves forward and knocking the Kings down three games in a row. Once they stop playing with their food, They'll be facing the Warriors tomorrow for a chance to go to World. Surely they can't kill Quick here, right? This fan is so tanky, even with the crits from Shinto. I imagine Hell's gonna have the Juke Juice to stay alive, and he does. <laughs> Quick gets the mental victory, not the game victory. That, of course, goes handedly to the Leviathans, thanks to Superior Farm, the semi-global presence that they use just systematically across the map. And I gotta give credit to Adapting, man. These rat ults were very annoying to try and deal with. And it wasn't like... A secret strat. He, he made it very clear early on. I'm going to try and go for variety a lot, right? I'm going to be in solo lane a lot. And then it was just, I'm going to see what my team does. I'm going to stand up in the sky and sort of watch. Who am I going on? I don't know. Who are you going to get low enough for me to try and one shot? And that fight just ended up being variety. He ulted from, I believe, green buffer, like just about between green and speed, and was still able to get variety like 10% HP so Final K could finish the job. And you get a lot, I want to say, a lot of even gameplay in that one, right? That pushes that a little further, right? Game one, uh, it goes, I believe, like the extra duration, but it's not even the entire time. Leviathans right. are ahead. Game two goes even longer, but it's not because the game's even. It's the Leviathans that are still ahead. The Kings just have some good late game fights. This time around, we truly did have an even game for a long point, but the Leviathans win out on that one. They win out 3-0 and advance themselves in the bracket. It's not the end of the road for the Kings. But right now, we'll celebrate the winners. That's going to do it for myself and Charlie. We'll go to the desk and they can break it all down. And a big start to the weekend for the Atlantis Leviathans. 3-0 over the Camelot Kings. A close start to this game. First 15, 20 minutes of this game. We look up at the top. Gold's even. No objectives are really being done. I look up, I think it was 22, 23 minutes. No gold furies. Fire Giants not even looked at. It's just a couple of pyromancers at that point. So this, at the start of the game was not a game of objective play. When it came down to the later half, though, Mifflin, that's when we start seeing these fights around fire, these split pushes by the Leviathans that are netting. And we even got to see one of the interactions that both Trellian and I guess myself at the start of the desk talked about with Mavon dashing across with a global to, to try and, you know, get a win. Unfortunately, he pulled the Mavon to another teammate, adapting there to really help out Shinto and turn that fight around. And, and I think Shinto is the crux of a lot of that team fight win for the Leviathans. Every single team fight that they start off around that fire giant, once we got to that objective pace game, it's... Shinto somewhere else on the map, just, yeah, sure, hope someone shows up to stop me. Oh, no. Well, oh, oh geez, it's it, it, it's Yarkor who's who's defending his Phoenix. I'm going to jump into your team shadows, loser, and it does exactly that. Or, oh, man, I sh oh, geez, sure, hope Captain Twig doesn't jump in, uh, in, in on me. He's going to do so much damage. Doesn't care, I'm back with my team, right? That, that global presence from Chernabog is just so impossible to deal with once you get to the absolute latest portions of the game uh, and the Leviathans leverage that incredibly well. It, it was almost just perfectly telegraphed every single time. Adapting's playing in the team fight with the rest of the squad, 4 versus 5 or 4v4, and if Adapting went up, Shinto went up. And if they're both up, he's, they're landing on slow targets, Adapting shot is aimed for them, and Shinto's landing on someone who's now knocked up and stunned, right? It's just every single time. So maybe your takeaway is Maman Brigitte can bleed. Maybe maybe the answer is just the globals. I think it's just a question of which one's more valuable. This is the play you were talking about, and I thought just ridiculous. Aegis beats timing perfect, sits in the wall, and adapting said, hey, buddy, it's me, your fellow Sky God. I, I will be here to assist you, and, and he was. Adapting showed up, picks up, I think, a double kill just in that little fight alone, and 7-2-7, and, seven. and Shinto does manage to break that 30K barrier, so it does hit his 11 million player damage milestone. Here in this game, it's looking shaky for a moment. He goes in that last couple of little team fights. He sent like 19,000. I'm like, I don't know if he's going to get it. A little bit of stat padding right at the end, and the fountain is able to help him get that. And now was that enough? It. Was it 30,000 I, I think it was 20, 29,000 roughly that he needed, so he just gets enough over that. What was that 11, 11 or 12 mil? 11 million. Congratulations, Shinto, on 11 million, man. Gets the 11 million player damage over the course of his career. His team gets a 3 0 against the Camelot Kings, and now they get a face off against the Oni Warriors. To fight for that first chance and that first, I guess, collection of spots to, to go and qualify towards the SWC. So what you're saying is next round of wins in the winner's bracket does confirm a trip to Worlds. They does go to Arlington, Texas. Does confirm either first or second seed. It all me. depends on how they can do there. So 
big matchups for tomorrow's ones. But before we can even get to tomorrow, before we can break down the rest of our day, we do have adapting standing by for our post-game interview. That's right. I got adapting here. And first and foremost, 3 0 win to start off this tournament. How's it feel? It's great. You know, very happy that we managed to somehow throw a game two and still win it. So. And that's the thing that's interesting. You know, game one, it feels like you guys get ahead really far and then just confirm it. Game two, some stumbles. What goes wrong there that, that makes it last so long? Well, we just double backed and they, I guess they saw us backing or they just, you know, felt like they had enough damage to just go for an FG pull. So they just rotated it and, you know, I was the only one there. So I tried to sacrifice myself to do it and it didn't work. Speaking of Fire Giants, uh, first couple of games, finally in game three, things made sense. But the first couple of games, we're seeing like 12 minute pulls. Do you think that's just the way the game's being played right now? Or is it just because you guys have no tanks, you didn't have to worry about it, all aggression? I mean, it's just when you have a lot of DPS, you can just look for objectives. Um, you find an opening on the map, you can get the biggest objective. You just get FG and, you know, you just get control of the game. I'm sure we'll hear from one of your teammates tomorrow before the set. Uh, but I do want to know, you know, moving forward, you have one more set between you and Worlds. How important to you is it to win that as soon as possible? I mean, obviously, just want to win everything from here on out. So, you know, very important, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Sounds good. Congrats on the 3-0, man. Thanks for your time. And we'll go back to the desk to close out the day. To win it all from here out. It's that easy. If that's the path to victory. That would net him another world championship. That would. If we're, if we're just going to talk pure empirics, right? Like, that would just win him worlds. He won everything, right? So, God, he, the king and a philosopher. <laughs> this guy is amazing. So is the rest of the squad around him. 3-0 for the Atlanta Leviathans. Puts down the Camelot Kings into the losers bracket and puts the Leviathans up against the Oni Warriors as well. Tomorrow, we'll have the Sticks Ferryman and Jade Dragons as our first match. So that match three and four that you see on the top side of the bracket, those will be our two for tomorrow. Winners of those ones guarantee them spot, as you can see on the winner on the decides first, second seed on the spot next to it. Winner of those matches guarantee themselves a spot over in the SWC. So if you win tomorrow, you go to Worlds. You lose tomorrow, it's not over. You jump down into the loser's bracket. And then Saturday, we'll find out what our third and fourth team will be. And then Sunday will be our seeding match to see who is first and second who is third and fourth, and for them, especially for the first and second, the actual bit of prize money that comes with it, and the choice of who your opponent is going to be at the SWC, not going to be determined immediately. Again, that waits all the way until January when we have those Worlds qualifiers, but a big matchups tomorrow as we determine what our first two teams going to Worlds is going to be. On behalf of myself, Myth, and all the other cast and everyone behind the scenes, thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow for day two.